Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. Uh, if you are on YouTube and you'd like to join the conversation, click on the little link below. You'll end up in Zoom. When you're in Zoom, you can click on the little link below and you'll end up in Makana. And that's really where you become a producer. Uh, you are driving the show with your questions, with your votes. Uh, it's very important that you do ask those questions and vote on those questions uh, because that's the whole show. <laughs> if you don't do that, well, it'll be a real short show. So, uh, so we really depend on you as the uh, as the producers to uh, really guide what we're um, you know what we're doing here. Now, if you'd like to answer some of those questions, you can get here early. Six forty a.m. Pacific Standard Time is the cutoff for uh, when uh, we are um, uh, going to take new panelists uh, for the day. Uh, if you're not sure if you're ready, you can come as early as six and uh, have you know be part of the conversation. You'll see us just chit chatting about things, me saying horrible things usually, um, but but uh, <laughs> which I did this morning. I was I was in rare form this morning. I didn't say anything bad bad, but it was a little rough. Uh, I had a lot of coffee this morning, and um, anyway, so uh, you'll uh, but you can uh, you'll see us talking about whatever we're talking about. But the, the important thing is that. Uh, that you raise your hand if you want to test something. That's really the, that's what the time is really there to do. Now, the first hour is generally general questions, whatever you feel like talking about. Um, second hour is usually something we want to spend a little bit more time on. Today, one of our own members, Greg Gibson, really made a huge pivot. And I think it's really important for us to talk through that process. So I invited him to come on and talk about it. He was a photographer. Now he runs virtual events. <laughs> and then he did that all during COVID. So uh, so it's going to be a really interesting to talk with Greg to talk about what it took to do that and, and how he made that pivot. Um, so he's going to be on for the second hour. Tomorrow, we're doing Ruthless Reviews again, but for audio. Now, what we're going to do here is for the panelists who come in, we're really going to dig into every little bit of the sound that we hear. So we, we do mic checks and that's good. But this is going to be really like I hear a little bit of noise in the background. I hear a little bit of this. It's not quite as bright. It's So I think it'll be really good for people who want to tune their ears into, uh, you know, like really what we're listening for as we try to maximize the quality of our mics. So that, that'll be tomorrow. Um, Alex Forty Goldner is going to be here. Uh, he's going to join us on Wednesday. He built for Mad in the Kitchen, he built one of the most uh, amazing uh, motion files that I've ever seen. <laughs> and so it just really, really solves so many problems altogether. And so I wanted to, him to bring on and just walk you through what he did and why he did it. Um, it's like a master's class in motion. So, so we're going to do that on Wednesday. On Thursday, uh, we're going to talk about working with talent. So how do we, uh, you know, how do we actually work with talent? How do we prepare them for these kinds of events? Uh, what what does it take to get people ready to go? Friday we're going to talk about the cloud again. Um, so uh, we're going to be talking. We're going to take Mad in the Kitchen as a as a use case again, and brainstorm what it's going to take to put it into the cloud. So basically, we're going to be testing putting it into the cloud over the next uh, eight weeks, and we're going to be talking about how we're going to approach that. We'll probably come back to that a couple times and talk about how it's working. Um, there'll be within the next three or four weeks, there'll be kind of a ghost event that's going on behind the main event as we as we start to test what it takes and if the, if there's anything missing. So uh, Friday will be kind of brainstorming. Saturday's a busy day. <laughs> so I know you thought you're going to have the day off, but Saturday's a busy day. Uh, so we've got education. Uh, we're starting off with David Milan from uh, from Harvard University. So he is the um, instructor. He's the professor for the infamous CS50, which is uh, Harvard's really pushing the envelope of virtual uh, classrooms. And so he's going to be on talking about what his, uh, his, his process is and, and how he got there and there to answer some of your questions. Um, we're then going to have Nick Justishin from Drexel University talking about Unreal. We're going to talk a little bit more about the metahumans because there's a lot of interest in it and we're really interested in it. So there's going to be a lot of uh, you know, coverage of that and, and, and dealing with that. Uh, he and Rick are going to um, be part of that, of that process and that, that discussion. And then, of course, we have Mad in the Kitchen. Uh, you do have to register for that. Um, that's the, the that's uh, you can cook that evening, five o'clock. Uh, so Nick is at ten a.m. and Matt Mad in the Kitchen is at, at five five p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. And you need to sign up for it. Uh, so look at the email that goes out every day and make sure that you get into that. All right, Guy is going to be managing the questions uh, today. So Guy, what do we got? First one's coming in from James Babbitt in San Diego, where our friend Bill, who normally reads the questions, is located, sunny San Diego, where I was born. Could you comment on Leo's new Discord channel and the monthly payment plan? I imagine that's the meeting that they set up for us to uh, um, 
uh, have today. So I don't have any comment. If you ask that tomorrow, I'll have a lot of comments. But I, I didn't even know about it. I, I knew that there was something coming. We have a we have a meeting among all of the hosts uh, today. So later later today, I'm sure that I, I imagine he talked about it on Twitter last night. Uh, I think it's a good idea. I mean, I think I was a proponent that building a a, a community around Twit made a lot of sense. So we'll we'll see how it goes. I, I I don't know anything other than I didn't even know what it was. I just figured out I'll know this afternoon. So uh, so now we know. I, I yeah. That, so there's that building a social network around your content makes. Uh, I you know that I would you know never do something like that. <laughs> so I think that actually our success might have might have had some impact on on that, on that process. So, um, but maybe, you know, I, we've been talking about it for a long time. I think it makes a lot of sense. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah. It's the only community format so far been like IRC. Is that the only yeah, format? Yeah. People had? showing up for the IRC it's in the webpage and everything else. There hasn't really been a community outside of that. So it's, it's, I think it's a genius idea. I don't know much about the structure yet. So next question. Next one's coming in from our own Sky Gleason. Alex, what is the funnel of use for Facebook to YouTube to Zoom and why? So I am after doing you know thousands of events on a lot of different social platforms, I think it's important that you find a way to build a high quality community, which is what we've done here, as opposed to a large porous community, which is what most people do. You know, people get caught up with reach, you know, and, and they get caught up with total views and so on and so forth. And what I look for is view time, you know, like how long an interaction and how long people are, are, are staying connected and how often they come back and, and all those things. Because if you can build that, you're going to end up with something that is much more resilient to all kinds of other things. And, and it's, it's harder to build. Um, everything that's worth something is harder to build. And so it takes, it takes more effort. It takes more focus. It takes more interactivity. It takes more including the audience. But I think that that is the thing. And 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 I believe that participatory media uh, is the future. So, you know, it's going to run over everything else. You know, it's not that everything else will go away. It's just everything else is going to fall into the background as we get used to having shows like what we have here, where we're all talking to each other. Or if you look at the cooking stuff that we that we did, that, the, the cooking tests that we did before Mad, and then also the, the, the Mad in the Kitchen, you, you're seeing this participatory media where we're doing things together and it's magical. You know, and as more verticals start to do that thing, you know, we've been doing it with media, we very seamlessly moved over to <laughs> cooking. <laughs> so, and raspberry pies and everything else. And when you see that, that comes from a high quality, you know, community. You can do a lot of interesting things when they're willing to experiment and be part of what you're doing. So that's, I mean, I, I, I need to state that ahead of time because I have a very strong opinion about that that I've built up over the last 20 years um, because it's what I was doing with Pixel Core. It's what I, and what I saw kind of failing with a lot of the stuff that we had done, the live streaming we've done for YouTube and Facebook. Um, I think that a lot of people, there's an opinion that you should meet your your viewers where they are that's that's a very common thing that you hear from ad agencies and so on and so forth i'm i'm not a big proponent of that i think that that what you should do is find ways to bring the audience to the place that you can interact interact with them the most powerfully and the place that you're going to get the highest average view time because average view time is going to um, massively improve how often they come back and how often they feel connected to the content or to the to whatever you're doing so Usually what, what I do when I'm given an opportunity is I use things like Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and everything else to draw people first to something like YouTube. We do that here, right? So I occasionally announce things on Twitter. I move people to here. We talk about it on shows. We move it, to, but they move, people generally first go to YouTube, but where the real, you know, where the real, uh, sauces is in zoom and in discord. And so we're, we're basically pulling people in to have them become part of that. And a lot of them don't. So we don't have the big numbers that everyone's looking for. What we have is a great community, you know, um, and, and it's, and, and so, and so I'm constantly looking for quality, not quantity. And, you know, ad agencies only, you know, they're, they're a little blunt in that area because they're just used to cumes, right? They're used to talking about thousands of people or tens of thousands of people or 500,000 people that they can have a transactional relationship with. A transactional relationship is I'll give you something if you give me something. And, 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 and it's a, and how do we, you know, basically uh, carpet bomb, you know, and not really worry about what we're actually doing, you know, like just, just go over all of this stuff. And, and, and it's why we hate ads. Like this is why we hate ads, right? Is because we're getting a whole bunch of stuff that's interrupting us all the time that we don't care about. So, so I'm not a big fan <laughs> of that, of that approach. So what I look at is everything as a 
all these other social networks to bring someone to YouTube and then, and then YouTube to bring people to Zoom, you know, so that we can now, they can actually be part of a community, you know, and then from there, maybe to just, you know, for us, it was Discord, which has been really great, um, you know, as far as fusing all that together. But I think that when you look at the experience that's happening in Zoom, even around Mad in the Kitchen, when you look at that, you're, that's a much more magical inter interaction than people just watching on YouTube. You know, and I think that the other thing that we're going to find as interactivity increases, one of the other things we find is that the production levels can be much lower when there's interactivity. We don't have, I mean, we have great mics and, and, and webcams here, but we're not, we don't have flashy graphics and we don't have stingers and we don't have opens and we don't have, you know, like all those things. They're fun. I like them. They're, they're, it's a fun little thing to do, but we don't need that. You know, and, 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 to, and to put it in perspective, we have uh, 10 to 12 times um, you know, this show has 10 to 12 times the view time of Facebook, I'm, I'm sorry, of, of YouTube, and 150 times the average view time of Facebook. Like, you know, like it's now it doesn't have as many people as those things, but they're real people, like the people that watch the show are real people who actually care about what they're doing and care about each other and care about that process. And that's what now it may grow, but you need that first, you know, you know, like, you know, we, we may get to a point where we have a lot and mm, boy, will that be great. You know, like, because now you're building something that's dense and really powerful, you know, and, and, and so I, I think that um, I think that that's a more important way approached in, from my my opinion is to is to do that. Should we you know, I'm, I'm fine with doing all the other stuff, but I think that it can be a distraction to try to do all the, you know, I, I, I love doing the video. So for me, like with Mad in the Kitchen. I love doing the video part. I love cu cutting the cameras and I love having the graphics and they're, they, you know, they're fun and it gives us as a group something to talk about. <laughs> so I like that too, you know, like as far as production and everything else. But if I was doing the show myself, like if it was my, if it was my show, I would just do a zoom event and stream it to Facebook <laughs> yeah, or I mean, it's not to Facebook, just to YouTube. I would just stream. I would do exactly what I'm doing in this show. I would just do that except we're all cooking together and it's all, it's all kind of a group thing and everyone can see what that experience is. Um, because that interactive experience, especially as we get better at it, like right now we're kind of experimenting, but as we get better at that interaction, that cooking experience is going to be much better than someone watching on YouTube, you know, doing it. And so, you know, it's, it, and, and the thing is, is that it's, that's, that's, that's how I would approach it. Uh, I, I don't know if it's right yet, but it, but it seems to be working. Well, here. you had me at, you had me at Tucker in the, as the quote goes, and right. the concept of community being. I don't know what that quote is, but anyway. Well, okay. it's, 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 it's Chris Fenwick again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, yes, so anyway, thank you so, for letting yeah. us be your, uh, your, your guinea pig. Well, and, and I think that it's, it's, it's less than a guinea pig and more of a, just a, a community. I mean, it, it, we're, you know, and I think that by creating something that's highly interactive and respectful and all those other things that we we're able to create something that we all enjoy, a lot of us, at least at least 100 and <laughs> 155 of us in Zoom and probably I don't know what it is the numbers are right now, but you know, there's uh, 33 watching on YouTube at the time at this moment, there's like almost 200 people that are showing up every single day you know, to, to, to do something. Go ahead, Guy, and then, oh, Jason, and then Guy, and then Alex, and then we'll move on. It doesn't Every, surprise. Uh, with, who was first? Was, uh, Jason, I'm sorry, I, I, I screwed it up. Jason, and then Guy, and then, and then Alex, go ahead. So it doesn't surprise me at all that, uh, that, you know, the ad agencies would choose a philosophy that promotes their kind of shotgun approach to more is better. No, 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 better is better. And that, that mm -hmm. really does, you know, at the end of the day, that's what makes a community um, not, you know, scattershot as much as you could possibly well, stand. Again, it's just, it's just a lot of old stuff that came from ad agencies. When you didn't have interactivity, you had to have lots of, lots of numbers because your, your return was 1%, right? 1% or 0.1% or whatever. So you had to have millions to get any kind of return. And, and that, that whole thought process of, of, you know, scattershot that, that is got to just cover all of that area is still something that keeps on infecting what we're doing today. Go ahead, Guy. Yeah, a lot of the times I try to look through the participants and figure out how to be a value to those people because we're really serving this audience. And so when you step back and you go, hey, who is that person? And I hear like, and see somebody like Bo, who he's a pretty big time dude in, in uh, his realm. And so a lot of these guys don't have time to watch, but they'll listen later or they're listening right now. And it's, it's really cool to know that we still are getting these people up to date um, right. Because the trends are changing so fast, and that's we're almost like a news show in some ways because we're yep. so cutting edge and just trying and failing. And it's 
an okay place to fail. And and to be clear, like the, the main reason that I've, I have the YouTube feed is not really to attract that many more people. It's really just as an archive service to our members. <laughs> you know, like it's just there to it's just there so people who can't who can't show up can can listen to it. And so to your point, I'm not I'm not really using YouTube like how do we get big numbers? I'm just using it for the people who miss the show. Um, uh, go ahead, Alex. I think um, we at the moment the the numbers are great for us to be able to sense who is contributing in the. Let's put it this way. Agencies who are looking for influencers, they'd much rather ha have an influencer who has two who has 2,000 people following them who, who gets 50% of those people to interact and to take part than to have right. somebody who's got 10,000 followers who's got um, five, you know, 2,000 people following them you know, who actually interact and do stuff. Because the person who's got a system or a method or a story or community they're building, if they build more, then they get more people. The same percentage probably stays the same as they go up. But yeah. I think maybe it's worth bearing in mind, do does Mukana or our interaction systems give points to people who are, are vote on more questions, who ask questions, um, or in terms of how the resource gets no. kind of combined together in terms of looking, be able to look back and see how, how we've evolved our thinking on things? Not yet. So um, uh, next question. Next one's coming in from Noah Sargent in Fullerton. I believe it's a matter of time before we have remote technicians controlling lighting, audio, cameras, and streams over the internet. What hurdles are there to getting to this future? Go ahead, Jason. Uh, well, one of those hurdles is standardizing the way that, you know, equipment interacts with other equipment. It's standardizing the glue. As far as, you know, point to point standardizing a secure connection over the internet, that's completely attainable. Things like, um, you know, is this input going to be the same on every mixer? Is it the same on every piece of input and capture hardware? That's where the industry historically has fallen apart. Mm -hmm. yeah, go ahead, Jeffrey. Yeah, it's, it's going to be latency and, and physics. I mean, we watched uh, yesterday as they tried to fly a helicopter in Mars, and, and not only was it tough to do, the, the, the video cut out for a second, so they didn't know where that copter was. So... That's going to be tough. And then when you get more remotes, you got more latency passing between uh, the areas. Go ahead, Roscoe, and then Doug, and then George. Noah's sitting pretty because within three years, the entire city will have uh, gigabit fiber. Which one? Fullerton, California will have gigabit fiber throughout the entire city for $60 a month from two different ISPs. Who are the ISPs? Uh, I could look them up. Future now. I'll look them up. Amazing. Doug? Well, some of those features here now, I mean, I take this Xbox controller and run a camera for Jeff Keithley sometimes, and it's amazing technology and latency is an issue, but I tell you what COVID has done for like the live broadcast, like ESPN is putting a lot of people out of work because now they can consolidate uh, into facilities where where you don't have to have people on site anymore to run the replay, be right. the graphics operator. You're having those people stay at home and, and even announcers are, you know, they're they're calling games from home. And it's it's a crazy world that we're living in. Yeah. Uh, Remy, which is what you know, this remote production has been called for a long time, has been in action for a decade. You know, it's not like this brand new. Uh, it, it has been kind of slowly building. It just got a, so. And, and again, this is also where something catalyzed it to go much faster than it was already going. If it hadn't existed before, it wouldn't have happened. You know, it wouldn't have gone from zero to you know zero to one hundred, but it did. It could go from thirty to one hundred really fast. And so that's part of what made this work. I think that the three things, from my perspective, are latency, as as Jeffrey said, um, also communication, just being able to get a hold of people and talk to the people that you need to. And finally, situational awareness, which is knowing what's going on, you know, on the on the ground, you know, and understanding what's what's actually happening. Go ahead, George, and then Mickey. Um, I think most of it has been mentioned already, but definitely the thing that I always keep in mind is, is everyone going to be able to stay connected? So you have to you have to really choose when you choose in a virtual crew, you have to keep that in mind also that everyone has good connection at home, and they're able to stay connected. One of our things that we're looking at doing is bringing, you know, we're really ramping up to do more and more cloud and more and more remote production, but we may have to require that folks that are coming in remotely have two connections, 
you know, like for the high profile stuff, like I need two diverse connections to their house, you know, to, to know that I can depend on them to do that job. Go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, I think one of the hurdles at the moment, at least, is that uh, not the the prevalence of gear that has the that have the proper hooks to be to be able to be controlled remotely. It, it's not uh, out there that mu that much yet. Like you know, especially with smaller facilities that don't have the the funding to be able to upgrade uh, more consistently. Consistently, uh, they're they're working on older like analog mixers and stuff like that. Right. So them moving up to more modern equipment that you can vpn into uh is what's needed for you know being able to being able to do this more prevalently okay. next question oh sorry guy i missed you yeah, go ahead yeah the thing about zoom rooms is that they're making it super simple to do a lot of this stuff with camera control so this is a zoom room and you can do this with the regular client too which is request camera control but one of the things that a lot of people don't know is that you can go in and you can program and in the top right of the controller i haven't fully programmed these because you need to actually buy something like this device from amazon where you can actually control uh, via infrared remote control so uh tons of you know stereotype things, anything that has a remote control you can control. This is basically just takes uh, ethernet to those little kind of sensors that, you know, television, DVD, audio, uh, it's, it's, it's in the back end. It's just ready to be programmed. So there's D10 TV, lights, projectors, curtains. You can program that stuff remotely and simply in the connection solid, you know, with, with Zoom, we're used to it. So it's coming. Some of the hurdles just, uh, people just need to be aware of them. They need to be aware that the bar has been lowered and it's, it can be easier. Absolutely. Let's jump to the next question. All right. Next one coming in from Jonas Dattel in Reutling in Germany. Any thoughts about the new features of the uh, Zoom release? Looks like uh, April Since 19th. it just happened this morning, I was already in when we brought it up. I, I, haven't, up, I haven't updated yet, so I don't have any strong opinions. It does say that the, it's, it'll be clear whether the, the original sound is on or off. That was the one thing I saw that stuck out. I was like, that's... It's a very confusing button for most most of our users, and so I'm, I'm excited to see that. Um, but yeah, so I, I I don't anyone else have any anything that jumped out? Uh, go ahead, Paul. I like the uh, vanishing pen, the uh -huh. new <clears throat> a new annotation tool. Yeah, there you go. There's the features. Yeah. Have you played it's, with it yet? I have not. I want to try it though. Let's bring it up. Let's bring it up again. Uh, my my invite is to bring it up again on Wednesday after we've all had a chance to download it and play with it, and we'll talk about it again. All right, next question. When choo Alex Forty Goldner from London, Europe says, when choosing a domain for a new venture, what are the advantages and disadvantages of going beyond a .com address or your local geographical top level down like a .co, uh, .uk? Go ahead, Jason. Um, if you're going to deviate from a .com, which as you can imagine, most people are having to do at this point, um, the the benefit is brevity and and clarity. The drawback is if you get too weird, if you get too weird into these TLDs, uh, top level domains, uh, there are some things like, for example, if you create a you know dot limo, um, there are some servers out there that will not validate a dot limo email address, and that can really get tricky as far as search engine optimization is concerned. There isn't a huge advantage, really. Domain names are for people. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, a couple that I've found that are good is uh, dot club if you're going to do a clubhouse, and then dot live if you're going to do a lot live show. But dot coms are still the king, you know. Dot coms, dot nets, dot orgs in that order, and then the, and then try to find some like Jason said that aren't going to be lost in the shuffle. Yeah, I personally don't think it matters anymore. <laughs> like I don't, I don't think the URL matters that much, other than. Again, not being seen by some servers if it gets too complicated. Uh, I think that the thing you do have to worry about is who has the .com because you know that can create some user confusion. Uh, if someone else has something that's like yours, or you're gonna, you're going to have to do more PR. So uh, from a .com because people will generally assume that it's that it's .com. But we've used a bunch of I, you know .io is a, is a is a nice uh, is a nice one to use, um, and a lot of other ones that are there's so many now, and I think that the danger that you have is that someone else will see you get successful and then someone else will see it and then they'll put something up that's like yours in dot com you know because they already had it and you know there's a complicated process around prior art 
in that area. So, so that, that becomes kind of a, uh, you know, complicated piece of, of, if you can't get it. Um, but I've, I'm slowly moving away from .com. You know, as as far as when I look at future URLs, um, I just I don't want to be oppressed <laughs> by the .com because it's just it, you know because you can't get them now, and a lot of people are just sitting on them, and you know they're not doing anything with them. Yeah, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, one caveat is that uh, <clears throat> uh, GoDaddy's kind of doing a loss leader thing where they sell you a, a .live or something for three dollars. But then watch out when it comes to renewal because they're going to bump the price way up. So you yeah, have to read read the fine print on these. The only new, uh, the only place I the only place that I I, buy, I get ones now is Hover. Like I just feel like it's the best service by far to use to get your URLs. You you don't need to do anything else there. And I would say GoDaddy is one of the worst. <laughs> they are just lizards. All right, next question. Next one's coming again from Jonas Intel in Reutlingen, in Germany. What do you guys think of the new Intel NUC 11 Compute Element AV Edition? It has a, it's a NUC with a built-in HDMI uh, capture card. Capture card? Cool. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you had me. You got me there on capture. What? Um, that looks really cool. Uh, go ahead, Mickey. I read the article earlier. It looks like they're using hardware by uh, Aver Media to do the capturing. Um, yeah, I think I would I would consider testing it. Um, though, if it were if it were like a hardware from a company like Agile, I would probably uh, not have any qualms about uh, recommending it. But I'll test it out first. How much is it? Do we know? Does it have a price? I searched around it, and came up with like seven hundred dollars, but I'm I that I was actually that was going to be my question. Does anyone know right. for sure? I mean, for me as a Mac user, seven hundred dollars gets too close to a Mac Mini, <laughs> even if I have to pay a little bit more for the capture. Uh, I'd have a hard time with a to do that at seven hundred dollars. Go ahead, Jeffrey. I, I think the seven hundred dollars would be if without memory, without hard drive, or anything like that. So. I was, I was just looking at some of the specs. Uh, I actually run an Intel Nook, uh, the previous gen, uh, sitting over there, and I've done some video capture on it. It's only got four cores, eight threads to it, and uh, it's only run. this one's only running eight gigabytes of RAM, uh, so it will probably work well with like a one to two camera setup, but anything more. Oh, yeah, and Thunderbolt 4, so you'll be able to uh, use your Thunderbolt 4 devices From the, from the well. chat, 494. 494 okay yeah that, that, it's it's in a good a good place with a capture card uh, i'd be interested in taking a look at it it's really interesting next question next one's coming in from noah Sargent in fullerton ndi yeah, seems to be widely untrusted and unproven could a redundant network setup primary and backup be used like dante or diversity's wireless microphone systems to increase stability go ahead jason it depends on what's wrong with NDI. In general, the, you know, the reason that something like um, Dante is so reliable is that it standardizes the delay. And um, NDI typically, and correct me if I'm wrong, but NDI doesn't do that, or it has to do that completely uniformly across an entire installation, but by default will not do that. And so the answer is yes, but it doesn't. I mean, NDI is being used by a lot of productions, so it's not, you know, it, it is a, um, it is because it didn't go through a standardization process, which allowed it to go faster. It's probably not as stable as what 2110 will be when it, you know, as it rolls out. 2110 is still just taking a long time, you know, to, to, to come out and it's going to be a much heavier because uh, it, it allows uncompressed and, you know, everything else that's, that's rolling out. So um, as an IP format, uh, a lot of people are using it successfully, especially in the cloud. Um, so I don't want to, you know, it's, it is, it can be, I think NDI is a lot more flexible, you know, and so, but with flexibility often comes a little bit of stability. And, and what it means is that like Dante, anything you're doing over a network, you just have a lot of flexibility. Like we had lots of problems with Dante until we got it worked out. And I think anybody who has the technical means to really work out NDI, I, I think is using it successfully. It's just that it's not as, uh, you know, when you hook up an SDI cable, it's kind of a dumb thing. <laughs> it does the thing and it moves it over and it's it's heavy and it's, but it doesn't have to think very much. With NDI, you have to think about the architecture. I don't know if Guy wants to add anything to that or not. 
Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. And there's simplicity there, especially when people first fire up like a, the iPhone app and Sienna made it super easy for it to just see that and they they get addicted. And they're like, wow, this just works. But then they start to build it out. And then there are some things that you need to tweak. And like I have an NDI discovery server running behind me in my house, you know, like that's crazy. But I've been doing the research as to how to make this better and work reliably every time to where all my sources and destinations show up every time. So I, I'm having really great success with it. But I also... Uh, have tweaked. I got a Ubiquiti Dream Machine. I think George has the same one, Dream Machine Pro. And so you you do some settings, you do the research. But I think a lot of the problems that people have had is just not a network that has been configured properly properly with uh, IGMP snooping, uh, MDNS. There's there's lots of little things. The proper ports uh, need to be addressed. You know, just making sure you're not colliding things. You could subnet things out. So there's there's a lot more to it. Yeah, go ahead, Mickey. Exactly. Uh these these protocols, these network protocols, uh, like MDI Dante, uh, there are white papers for all of them that you can read and go through and study to see what the network infrastructure uh, is, uh, what what network in infrastructure is required for your specific use case, and even like simple things about like um, calculating the amount of band. It's like say if you're if you're uh, using a total of like you know twenty streams or fifteen streams in and out of the same machine. A simple gigabit uh, network won't suffice for that. A simple gigabit NIC. So you really have to, you know, do the homework for it. Next question. Next one's coming in from JJ McKenna in Santa Venetia, California. What is the difference between a branded YouTube channel versus a personal one with respect to management? Note, access to scheduling seems truncated for delegated access to a personal account. The goal is that the a branded channel should be able to be powerfully managed by a, a larger number of people. Like that is like what they're trying to kind of build up. The, the personal one is really designed to only have one person be able to log in and manage their account. And they can give a little bit of, of approvals to other folks. We are having, we were talking about it earlier as it pertains to um, uh, a YouTube channel that we're using that for some reason, editors don't have access to some of the live events and so on and so forth. So I have to, I'm not sure what, how it's set up right now. I will admit that I, I mean, we're going to, we're going to do, we're going to do more of it on our end. It, it, the, I have to figure it out too. Mine is person like what you're watching this on is, is a personal channel and Jeffrey has a limited number of things he can do without logging in, but we're still seeing some of the same limitations in branded channels. Uh, we're not sure exactly what the thought process is there right now. They, they're constantly changing the permissions of how these channels work. And so it's kind of like, well, this is what it is this week. So, so, but the goal behind a branded channel. If you want to have more than one person or lots of people logging in and you don't want to give them the password for the account, generally you'd build a branded channel. But you, but I have to dig into it more to figure out. I haven't built one in a long time. And so I have to go in and figure out what they've changed because evidently we're, <laughs> they've changed something I don't understand. So, uh, so we're going to work on that. Um, but well, that's the goal. You should, if you will have multiple people logging in and doing things on the channel, it should be a branded channel. If it's your channel, it should be a, an individual channel. That, that's the best way to kind of approach that. Because otherwise, you're giving people passwords to your own channel, um, which it's not so much that person. It's that if, if that person gets hacked and they lose the thing, then you end up, you're, you're just spreading out the the risk of someone getting into your channel and then, lo then locking you out. Um, next question. Next one's coming in from Brian Carpenter in Cleveland. Heil PR40 site claims to not need phantom power because it is a dynamic mic. Does that mean an XLR to 3.5 millimeter adapter cable can be used straight into the audio input of a USB capture card for Zoom? Or is a preamp interface purchase still required? Go ahead, Jason. That's a great question. I'm pretty sure that if Brian has it, lots and lots and lots of people have it. I will go so far as to say the Heil PR40 cannot use phantom power. Phantom power is a is a. It just ignores it. Yeah, it ignores it. So I mean, the purpose of using phantom power for a dynamic mic like this or any other would be for a cloud lifter to basically put a preamp in there. And as far as the rest of it, I, I'll defer to Mickey. But yeah, it's it's go it downright cannot use it. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, Brian's asking about using a PR40 with a simple uh, little interface like the, like the, what do you send out again, Alex? Uh, oh, those little USB connect. I think it's mostly he just wants to get it to a 3.5 yeah. inch. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can you can use a regular cable adapter, and while there will be a, an impedance a mis mismatch there, uh, you can technically use it, but the likelihood of that 
a little interface, having enough clean gain to drive a PR40 would be quite low. I mean, even uh, more, more uh, high, a little higher end um, uh, interface, like say the Focusrite's have a hard time driving up here for you with more a little little uh, the uh, impedance on that interface. is absolutely going to kill you um next question next one's coming in from noah sergeant fullerton any ptz camera recommendations that can actively pan tilt and zoom while on air most i've seen don't do well at smooth movements so a lot of that has to do with the quality of the controller and the operator uh so there are controllers that the hard part you get into is the less expensive controllers tend to be a little bit harder to get and the less expensive pdz's don't have the same motor mechanism so uh we, we we've had cha a challenge with like for instance stuff like ptz optics uh you know having getting it to really be as smooth or rush works have both been things that we've had trouble with of doing it on air now we have when you get into the, like the Sony uh, BRC line the BRC 900 is what we used a lot and as well as the um, some of the uh, Panasonic lines, uh, we've, we've, and then of course telemetric, telemetrics, we definitely can pan and tilt. The interesting thing is, is that a lot of it has to do with the camera operator or the you know who can do what. We found that the best pan tilt zoom operators are gamers, not camera operators. Camera operators complain about the PTZs constantly. You just get this long stream of like this is not as good as a camera. We were in a show one time in New York, and I suddenly saw them just panning with it. And I was like, did we put a camera back there and a camera operator? I don't think we budgeted for that. I was like, I don't understand why we're panning back and forth with this. It didn't make any sense. And I looked over, and there was my my uh, someone I brought in was sitting there just operating the, op you know, operating the joystick and just panning and tilting. And I asked him, I said, how did you learn how to do this? And he goes, this is so much more control than an Xbox. <laughs> you know, like it was just Halo. immediately, you know, it was just Halo. like, he was just, yeah, yeah. It was like, this is like, I, this is like a luxury, you know, Cadillac. And so gamers do that really well, uh, much better than, than um, the average camera operator. And from my experience, go ahead, Mickey, and then Paul. Yeah, just one of those controllers, uh, the more, uh, more the, the more affordable controllers don't have the resolution for you to be able to do proper feathering on your movement so you know yeah. to to ease into the movement and to ease out of it you really need that resolution so that you can slow down the the movement properly and some of them like the sony controllers and the panasonic controllers do have some of that that buffering on the on the far end so when you go to it it'll, it'll just slow into when you stop it won't it won't do it immediately but that's again on the higher end controllers um go ahead uh, paul and then roscoe and then guy yeah what <clears throat> what budget is he on is he on a champagne budget or a beer budget i've got uh, he the, didn't uh, he, he just asked the question the logitech yep. and that, PTZ. right and we would say that that's not broadcast not, not too great no. not not great at all not the greatest <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's that's a good lock off <laughs> camera uh, go ahead go ahead roscoe and then guy yeah, I got some great information from like 1F Jeff and people here, Guy and whatever, and looked at the Scarhoy controller, but ended up with the Panasonic on Panasonic uh, 150s. Just beautifully smooth, got a demo, field engineer came out, and nothing really compares to getting a good controller that matches the camera. And and did you get the larger controller? There's uh, yeah. A, there's a, yeah, the larger board, I feel like the Panasonic, lar the larger board, I can't remember what the... The yeah, I know, but we had to get a Scarhoy. Anyways, the preview on that is mm -hmm. the problem, but we had to get a Scarhoy just to route the preview properly. Oh, interesting. Uh, guy? Yeah, the UE150 that uh, Roscoe got, uh, in comparison size-wise, this is a Bird Dog P200 on the right. That's the UE150 that Roscoe just got. So the motors in this thing make that deceleration graceful. So it's yeah. like velocity and after effects. It's like you can ease in, ease out with this thing like you wouldn't believe. So it's really smooth. I mean, look at the size of a person's head compared to the size of that camera. It is huge. So that's really helpful in those easing of those jerky movement. Yeah. Uh, next question. Next one's coming in from James Babbitt. Could Sky or Guy show or post more photos of the setup on Saturday at Matt in the Kitchen? We can do it really quickly. Uh, we do spend, the, the thing to know about Matt in the Kitchen is that we spend a lot of time at, right after the show talking about it. Um, and we also, so you you really want to go to the Matt in the Kitchen show, even if you're even if you're not interested in the cooking part, because... You get to watch them. We're going to get more and more of the comms into the into the feed to you. Uh, you're getting to watch the multi views, and then we're having a 
literally we come right out of the show and have a hard discussion about what happened and what worked and what didn't work. Um, and so there's a, uh, so we're, we're doing a lot of that. And then Sunday has become kind of a mad in the kitchen, uh, uh, morning. So, so we are talking a lot about it on Sunday as well. So, um, we'll go through it in just a, for a minute because, uh, we're, we've got still got a ton of questions. I, I uh, shared about in. three images. So if guy mm -hmm. wants to share them, that's perfectly fine. There's this is the physical kitchen. This is physically yeah. the, the guy, the guy that showed up at six to 40 in the morning with, um, with his amazing gift of, uh, skill. We have a small space to work in, and uh, that's the entire control room. We added these additional lights over the top. That's Alex's camera uh, pointing down to the, the the television. I'm sorry, pointing down to the stove. And uh, I thought we had, and this, <laughs> and this is the inside the the kitchen itself. If you look closely, guy brought just a little lens, like little little just Fujinon, a little twenty to one twenty Cabrillo. Piece of piece of joy and this is the thank you to mickey sign because we, we couldn't get him into the uh, credits fast enough so we do have again uh eric hall loaned us his 4k with my wide angle lens shooting straight down stealing that uh look from the chef show from jonathan favreau um we do product mm -hmm. placement in the sense of putting mats on the floor that say mat in the kitchen we put the the, the call the fridge of fame and this this is the mm -hmm. how do you block out the light from the skylight in the ceiling you have guy climb up on a ladder and throw mm -hmm. whatever you have over the That's top right. of it where I, I come from western pennsylvania we call that appalachian engineering we uh we did and there's a total light that really did a bounce effect off of the the wall below we thought we were going to get the ghoul lighting but but guy again brought some additional mm -hmm. gaff truck equipment and yeah. just amazingly helped us fill in some of the the holes and the gaps yeah. this is but, a brand new light system that we put up over the over the ceiling yeah. So I, de I definitely recommend uh, coming to it and because we're going to we break a lot of this stuff down and talk through it right after the show as well as uh, on Sunday morning. So I definitely try to find time in those one of those windows to, to look and at all, all of this is the yeah. experiment of, yeah. of how to do it better. So thank you yeah. for anything you can help with. Absolutely. Next question. Next one's coming in from George Kennedy has been playing with SRT up in the cloud. Alex, is SRT usable as your main output to AWS Media Live Encoder or is RTMP still the go-to? Uh, currently for us, we're doing Zixi <laughs> via the Media uh, uh, Elemental Live or the, the links. So if we're putting it into AWS, we're using Zixi to get it up, get it up there. Go ahead, uh, George. So... Amazon just came, uh, allowed SRT into Media Connect. Mm -hmm. So I'm now able to push from my cloud machines, Vmix cloud machines, I'm able to push, well, expose SRT into Media Connect and then put it into Media Live. What I found yesterday in doing some testing, it's about a minute for the switch in Media Package. It might be just the repackaging is taking a longer time, but I find the latency is a little bit longer in the switch between then, sources. A minute's a long time. Yeah. Uh, that is that from good. from when you turn it on or from when you uh is it when you provision it? it it should take so if you're provisioning it and turning it on from scratch it should take a minute and 15 seconds or a minute and 16 seconds to be exact yeah the setup was pretty quick but um it might be media packages doing something from um, funky so but i have to take that's a look already, at that. that's a that's a currently running event that's taking that's if you so if you turn off a connection to aws and you turn mm -hmm. it back on it has to reprovision that that connection, and so if that's what you're talking about, it should take a minute and sixteen seconds. Um, no, I'm talking you know, about it. It, so everything is fully running. So uh, when I switch from one source to the next, when I'm looking at it and on the it's player, a minute? it's taking a lot, about forty five seconds for yeah, that switch something. to happen. So the latency is really high. I don't know if using SRT as an output for to media live should cause any issues yeah, or no. that much latency. Yeah, go ahead, so, guy. Uh, George, I have that same link. Uh, uh, when I send it up, I go up to Media Connect via you know that Zixi protocol and over sideways, uh, even using RTMP, I was still getting under five seconds. So uh, maximum 10 seconds to, yeah. to go all the way over to my vMix instance. And that's in the same data center. And what I'm envisioning now is being uh, in the like three seconds or two second range. So that's Zixi all the way up and then SRT over in the same subnet. Uh, to my my vmix because it's that rtmp right now that's killing me adding like two two more seconds so i, I think something's definitely not right or maybe i'm not looking at yeah your, your so, so right. it's it's on the it's on the the last leg so i'll take a look at it today and mm -hmm. report back but yeah, the absolutely. srt is working good on uh on aws 
Now our, our producers have been highly effective today. So we're going to go into kind of a, we're going to start going into a pretty accelerated mode. Uh, so just letting our, our uh, panelists know, go ahead. Next question. Next one's from Paul Prusikowski in Gainesville, Florida. I am considering buying a gimbal for my Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K with small rig cage. I heard a lot of good things about the uh, mounting of a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K on the DJI Ronin S, but many of the reviews expressed difficulty balancing due to the shape of the camera. Any suggestions from the panel for a good gimbal for the camera with cage? Uh, go ahead, Jason. Yeah, the most recent uh, Ronin is absolutely fantastic. And the trick is pretty simple. You just need counterweights. This is 100 grams coming from small rig. And I have successfully balanced a lot, you know, really big lenses on the RS2. Um, assuming it's the most recent one, it's absolutely fantastic. And yeah, you need a counterweight. It's worth it. And you get those from small rig for their own, for their own pieces to, to do that. Got it. Next question. Chad Lafarge, also known as the Chadinator in St. Louis, Missouri, <laughs> says, did anyone catch former President Obama, Shaq, and Charles Barkley addressing vaccination via Zoom last night? How do you think we are progressing in terms of remote production value? I didn't see it. Did you see it, Jeffrey? I saw a little bit on the news today. I guess they were using laptops and uh, C920s for the cameras. So the angle uh, of Obama was pointing up. So you got the nose uh, look to it, but uh, it looked pretty decent. I'm always kind of surprised when you have someone that's going to, you know that you have the people involved that are going to have a lot of views and then you don't put the time into it to, I know it's being reactive because they're, anyway, but but I, I don't think that, they, uh, I don't think people think that out. <laughs> it's going to show up in the news. It's going to be seen by millions of people. It seems like it would be worth spending a little time on the camera. Um, next question. Next one is from our friend Peter Rosado in Las Vegas, Nevada. Says, is Logmian's Hamachi considered an option slash backup for hardware VPN like Meraki? I don't know enough about it. Go ahead, Mickey. And then and real quick, to, both with you and Jason. According to one of, uh, one of Jeff, yes. There you go. Uh, go ahead, Jason. No, that's good enough. Okay, next question. <laughs> uh, Will O'Neill in Alexandria, Virginia says, I'm doing some fancier Zoom meetings with a client. We have good lighting, sound, chroma green screens. A customer wants to imply depth on the other end to separate the speaker from the background. Any way to do that? Note, pick of our current setup. It's hard for us to see the pick, you know, like to do it in real time as far as looking at the images, but... Uh, I mean, separating the background from the foreground, there's a couple things that you can do um, as far as the background looking like it's behind them is to blur the background. Um, you know, typically it's it's hard to get a good green screen. <laughs> so, but the number one rule is always make sure the, that the background is softer than the foreground. Uh, and that is, if you leave it as is, you throw that image in the back, it's not going to be. It's always going to be sharper because the video is going to be softer just a raw video will be softer than the image that's behind them so if you're going to green screen something you always should blur that background just a little bit to to pop them out um, go ahead jason yeah the only thing i would add to that is uh he didn't say anything about the lens it's it is super critical that you have tack fark tack sharp focus and a um and a really really wide aperture and that'll give you the nice well, blur and then you're gonna you're, you're gonna blur the background in in um, photoshop the one thing I will say is that I would actually not open it up. So when I do this, I tend not to open up the, the lens all the, all the way. And the reason I don't do that is that the lens is, tends to be sharpest at about halfway through. It's so about five, six, plus or minus a little bit is to, where most lenses tend to be the sharpest um, in, their, uh, in what they're doing. Also, you actually want a little bit more depth of field because if they blur on, their, on the sides of them, it actually makes it harder to, go to get a good key. So unless you have a really good setup, you know, uncompressed 444, pulling it, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to deal with that soft edge. And finally, it lets them lean back and forward, and you can always blur the background to separate them. So uh, you do want to blur a little bit because to, to Jason's point, you want to get rid of some of the imperfections in the green screen if there are some. But you want to be careful of, I actually go a little closed down if I can, um, just to make sure that I they can move around and I get hair detail and I don't, I don't have to deal with a soft blur on their body. Uh, next question. Next one's coming in from Nick Pavlinak uh, in Southeast Michigan. I ordered the portal TV yesterday and was wondering what is the most economical way to get the pile headset into the portal TV? 
Or are the eight microphones decent enough on the camera? Will the USB-C port on the camera be able to take the microphone input with an adapter? Has anyone done that? The, 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 the audio in the Portal TV is not great. Right, go ahead, Roscoe. Yeah, I actually had them same day shipped last night and we'll do some experimenting, but I don't think so. Right. I'm not sure it's going to take that in. Next question. Next one's from Frohan Banwell in San Diego. Curious about insurance when taking good video camera lens, et cetera, into the edge of a youth sporting event or similar situation. Go ahead, Jason. If you're not a professional, I should remind you that uh, homeowner's insurance or renter's insurance will cover the things you own. It doesn't necessarily have to be in your house. As far as additional riders, um, you might want to check on those before you bring it to a youth anything. If you use a, if you, again, if you use a, if you're using them professionally, you can't, you can't take them. Your homeowner insurance will not cover them or generally won't. So you will need extra riders. You can get, by the way, individual riders for a given day if you want to. And sometimes those aren't that expensive if you really feel like you need to do it. Go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, there are a lot of uh, uh, insurance providers specific for the entertainment in industry. So take a look at that. Yeah. Next question. Next one's from David Brady in New York. He says, my studio is a mess, reworking for the extreme ISO and have a surplus mini ISO. If I were to use this as a sub switcher, which sources should I consider for the mini? Camera, playback, telestrator, or other? And he Great, has a Jason. note here that says, hoping to get back online for tonight. Great, Jason. It depends very heavily on, um, on, on the kind of rig you're trying to create. But as a rule, I think a certain type, for example, if you were to input all of your computer screens in as a sub switcher, that would be a good, meaningful distinction. Yep. As far as playback and the rest of it, probably. Yep. Go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, I would put whatever sources uh, that need lower latency, like, like say your own camera, if you're using it for con web conferencing, put it at the, the switcher that is closest to your computer. Yep, no, absolutely. Next question. Next one's from Noah Sargent in Fullerton. I'd love to see the Office Hours team showing off their full kit setups for live events and streaming. Any chance of this in the future? Put that into the... I. I we can do some show and tells. Uh, I think a couple of us have that um, for not just for our own kit, which we showed last week, but but for kits that we've done for production. Just put that into the second hour suggestions, and we'll get that in pretty quick. Um, next question. Next one's from Philip Oler in Katona, New York. Two Ethernet ports on my Mac Pro. If I connect both to my router, will I get two times the upload and downloads? Uh, Jason, real quick. Intranet, maybe, but you're going to have to bond it, so not automatically, and you need very specific switching to to be sure that it works. Yeah, go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, you, you can get a, a more bandwidth on your local network, uh, but you have to properly set up link aggregation on both the Mac and also your switch, whatever you're connecting to down the line. Yep, next question. Next one's from Cherik Cheetah in Dallas, Texas. Has anyone used or currently used ShowFlow? Looking for a good program to integrate run of show with our vMix setup. Any thoughts or recommendations? We have used ShowFlow. It works really well. You have to buy into it. So that's the, I mean, what I mean by that is you have to buy into the experience. You can't start doing things parallel to it and expect it to work well, but we've definitely used it in, in events and, and found it to be very, very useful as far as managing. Now I'm talking about managing the show. I know that they do their own virtual event um, process and I don't, I haven't used that, but we've used it in the past and it's been, it's been very successful. No, next question. Next one's coming in from our own Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. South by Southwest is now 50% owned by PMRC, a Hollywood media venture that handles publishing operations for brands like Rolling Stone, Billboard, Variety, Vibe, and The Hollywood Reporter. What impact will this have? My guess is that it'll have what it'll have is you'll see more media coming out of South by. It'll be it'll still be the great event that it is now, but there'll be more streaming, more media, more reproduction of it. Uh, so they'll actually the camera work and the, everything else will start to go up. It won't be seen as a side thing um, because that's what um, Penske uh, will will want to do with it. And that's I mean that's what they that's what they do. <laughs> so so that I, and I and I think it's a great opportunity for both sides. I think it's a it's a killer partnership. So next question. Noah Sargent Fullerton. Any speculation on when the Blackmagic ATEM 2 me update will be released? Any features you're hoping for? And he says it's NDI for him. Again, the is probably a long shot for Black Magic. Um, you know, I, I think that that would I'd be 
surprised uh, in that area. I mean, I think the new Kier would be would be useful. Multiple uh, MEs or multiple super sources would be would be pretty slick. I mean, those are two things that are really high on my on my list of things that I'd like to see there. Um, and then the better MEs or, or better MVs that that you see in the constellation and even in the extreme. So hopefully uh, we'll see that. Next question. I'm just answering because no one else is raising their hand. We're going fast. All right, next question. TJ Asher, Minneapolis, Minnesota. The pre pre show did not close automatically today when Alex started the main webinar. What changed so that this expected past behavior is now different? Can people now have more than one meeting slash webinar happening at once? What's interesting is is that it I, I did notice it didn't give me the warning that it was going to close the other event when it opened this one. So it may have been it. I now have a business account and I have a bunch of rooms. I have a bunch of other things. So we'll have to test that behavior uh, even after this one to see what happens when we jump to the post show. Um, next question. Edwin Rose in Chicago. Hi, Alex. Looking for a proper microphone to go into a Shure XTU within the 100 to $200 range. They would be sent out to remote guests. So any full package solution, sub 300 is also appreciated. Yeah, go ahead, Roscoe. Yeah, SM58 with that, uh, if you don't mind seeing the microphone right at their lips. Go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, SM58, or if uh, you're okay seeing like a Lavalier Countryman B3 would be in the $200 range. I mean, the main reason that I lean, I, <laughs> main reason I lean towards headsets is mostly not knowing what the environment's going to be like. So I'll tend to lean, and there's hard, that's a really hard number for a headset. So it's, you know, you either go, you know, that, nothing sounds, nothing under $150 in a headset sounds much better than a pile or, a, or, a you know, or a Pulson, but the, you, so you really have to get to like 450 before you start getting countrymen or 500 to get to countrymen. Uh, the, the labs are good. The problem really gets into when people have a, a roomy area. So I choose sibilance over roominess. Like that's the, that's the choice that I make when I, when I send those out is you'll get more sibilance with the, with the headset mic. Um, Yetis are also pretty good, you know, as far as just throwing something up that, that line, uh, if you're willing to put it in the, in this, in the, uh, if you're willing to put it in this in shot, or as you can see with Alex slightly, you know, just there and you can move it out and you get it, but they do a pretty good job as well. Um, next question. Next one's from Carmi Vineswig at Redondo Beach. Thank you for the pronunciation there. Uh, has anyone looked at or used the Dolby conferencing API for building custom zoom meetings? I haven't even seen it. Is that new? Is this similar uh, to what the Blue Jeans is using? Yeah, I don't. I don't know. We'll have to take a look at it. I'm. I'm not. Uh, I am not familiar with it. So yeah, we'll we'll we'll, we'll do some research on that. Um, next question. Next one is from Noah Sargent Fullerton. The Motorola radio is used on most TV film sets that I've been on. There is no built-in compressor slash limiter. Is there any way to design and build an accessory to accomplish this? I don't. They're pretty low, low. I mean, they're pretty straightforward devices. So I think that, that would be unlikely. Um, uh, go ahead, Mickey, real quick. Just, just Mickey. We're just going to answer this real quick. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure there is some sort of compression happening within the radio, but that we have no control on the parameters of that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Next question. Next one's from Vincent Alvarez in Bellingham, Washington. Anyone catch the Academy of Country Music Awards? Was great other than lacking audience energy slash cutaways? Almost pre-COVID quality, best music, uh, and he has in parentheses, level mix out of the dozen award shows I've seen this past year. Haven't seen it. Well done. Uh, George, uh, 10 seconds. Great show. A little bit of um, the lip sync parts. Killer. Just didn't, didn't make it happen. Got it. Next question. Mark Harder, Brooklyn, what streaming to YouTube, when streaming to YouTube on jobs, you mentioned having a separate preview feed. Is that complete separate feed that is private or is it attached to where the show will eventually show up? So the way YouTube works is that you have a, um, the, the way the way that works is that you go up, up to an ingest point and then that ingest point, that's what you're streaming to, can be attached to multiple, if you do a, a persistent key, like you manage your keys and create it, you can go to as many events as you want. So what we do is we stream to a preview event that we just leave on all the time. Uh, that one's never gonna be seen by anyone. We just turn on this other one when we're ready to go, but it's the same ingest going to the same thing. So it's just adding a, a, a connection to it. And that, that that's how we do that. And so that we can be previewing this an hour and a half ahead of time. And we turn put this one into preview you know, half an hour before, and then, and then we just flip this one on anytime we want. 
So, um, and, and, but you're still, you, you, the key, the key is to make sure the key is to make sure that your stream key is the same. Next question. Peter new in Stockholm, Sweden road connect makes virtual audio and passing audio between applications simpler. Anyone tried? And it says level of end user friendliness is high comparatively. Anyone use road connect? Yeah, go ahead, Roscoe, 10 seconds. Yeah, I just started, um, and it's it actually, it's, it may be end user high, but professional tools are some lacking. Got it. So. Right. Next question. Mickey in the Philippines and also on the panel doing a great job switching with regards to AWS charging for outbound traffic. Does traffic between instances count towards that? I right, go ahead, uh, Jim, real quick. Uh, only uh, if it's leaving the region are you charged. Inside the region, it's free. That's great. Next question. Uh, wow, this is a tough one. Gert Maihai, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm not even going to try that one. As anyone exper experience with Vimeo as a By the way, service, just a quick great. reminder that in your notes sec in your own profile section, you can now put in a pronunciation of your name and your location. Uh, in in inside your profile inside of Mukana. So if you're using it, please use that because it really helps us. Uh, next question. Or, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, has anyone experience with Vimeo? Is uh, is a paid service, but gets much and more gets more and more popular. Uh, yeah, we we have a lot of success with Vimeo. It's it's a it's a you know as a white or as a as a you know a, a clear label system. You can it, it works really well. Um, you're paying for it. Pay a thousand bucks a year or something to get the full kind of being able to do everything you want with it. It's not unlimited. If you get really popular and you have 40,000 people watching your show, they're going to call you and want to bill you. So when they say unlimited, it's not really unlimited. So just know, know that as you go in. Um, but they have great tools as far as live streaming. They have it's, it's probably one of the best kind of low cost versions before you start getting into industrial and industrial is like uh, Akamai <laughs> and AWS. Um, it, it, from an ease of use perspective, as far as just being able to, it, it'll stream to lots of services, but it'll also let you do your own streaming. Go ahead, Paul, like 10 seconds. Yeah, I just switched to Vimeo for my commercial accounts and I did it because I'll have total control. I hope they won't be able to, you know, mm -hmm. cut me out or do things that YouTube could do. So right. for that reason, I switched. Yeah. Next question. Next one's from Don Modine in Manchester, Connecticut. Could we get a behind the scenes live Zoom feed of the setup for Mad in the Kitchen? Yeah, we're working on that. Hopefully for next week we'll have we'll have a behind the scenes camera. No, next question. Deborah Wood Fork in Washington, DC announced today Herman Miller purchased Knoll. Any thoughts? I know about Herman Miller. I don't know about Knoll. <laughs> so Paul, real quick. I don't know about Knoll, but uh Chris Fenwick said I should get a mirror chair. I got one. And it is awesome. The <laughs> there we go. There we go. Excellent. Next question. Tor Gresdal, Oslo, Norway. Have you tried displaying a pre-recorded audience on a teleprompter to help the speaker? And were you honest about it with the speaker? Pre-recorded audience? No, we've never done that. What, like a laugh track <laughs> or yeah, something? Yeah. Well, yeah, just so they have someone to look at. Uh, haven't done that. Oh, and Greg's here. So, Greg, if it's okay with you, we're going to answer the last two questions, and then we're going to jump straight to you. So, uh, um, I, I don't, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. I would rather get people in the office to jump on and, and nod or something like that. I don't think I would put a. I think that would get weird. Um, next question. Aaron Husledge in Durham, North Carolina, with poor, expensive slash shipping to certain places in the world. How do you recommend getting kits to folks outside of the U.S.? Um, it depends on the region of what you do. Real kits, uh, we use Rocket. It's not the cheapest way to go, but it'll show up when they said it was going to show up exactly where it's going to show up. They're going to manage all the carne. They're going to manage everything else. Um, that's the way you get things in and out. If you have support in country and you're and you know what you're doing, you can do counter to counter. If you, but you have to be registered with the airline to do that. You can also do uh, FedEx, DHL. Uh, you know, to send even large stuff over. <laughs> Just be careful. DHL is not the most tightly wound company in the world. And so we've had them end up in the wrong city. Uh, Mickey, real quick. Yeah. A lot, some countries have freight forwarders that are in the U.S. that can very, very easily handle sending stuff to the to the other country. Or if it's if the gear is available in the other country, sometimes it's a lot cheaper to actually just buy it there. We've put people on planes. 
<laughs> another way to do it like literally just the best the fastest to get it overnight it was actually cheaper to put someone on a plane with the, with the item than to try to fedex it so it's it's possible next final question and then we're going to move to greg here chris widener lafayette indiana has anyone had any experience good or bad with the mix 16 pro ipad apps for pre-recorded playback looking to use with an 11 inch ipad pro i have not used it, it stumped us Oh, that was a, uh, hmm. I'm, uh, I'm interested. Maybe we should get those guys on, have them talk to us. We'll put it in the second hour of suggestions. We'll see if we can do that. All right. Changing gears. Uh, we are now, uh, graced by the presence of Greg Gibson. Uh, Greg, uh, has, Greg started off, um, you know, uh, we saw him showing up every once in a while and we're not sure when Greg, we're having a little connection issue there. There we go. Uh, we started off, um, uh, seeing Greg pop up every once in a while, trying to figure things out. And suddenly he's gotten himself into a whole new business. And, and I thought, you know, he's mentioned it a couple of times where we've talked about, it. I remember pre-show, post-show during the show. And I've just been like, wow, people really need to kind of hear what happened there. Because I think a lot of people are trying to figure out how to pivot uh, or how to get into this industry. And, and I thought it would be useful to, uh, to bring Greg on and, and kind of have him, uh, share his story about how, how that works. So Greg, can you tell us a little bit about how this all happened? Yeah, Alex. Um, first of all, I just want to make sure my audio is good. I, I want to get that Mickey. Can I get a thumbs up from Mickey? That's like one of my goals, like one of the high would be one of my highlights to get a Mickey thumbs up. So yeah. I just want to say thanks for that. And I kind of feel like the kid that, you know, like makes it to the pros and then all of a sudden he's like playing on the same team with Michael Jordan and LeBron and that kind of thing. So I'm very like honored and humbled to be here with you guys. Um, so, you know, I had a pretty successful photography business. I was a journalist for, um, you know, the better part of 25 years. I did it at a very high level, uh, around 2000, I, I left journalism and, you know, started my own business and, you know, doing weddings and portraits and that kind of thing. And I was actually kind of in the process of transitioning over to, um, doing more corporate events because, you know, I was getting a little older. It's getting a little harder to relate to sort of the 30 something brides. And so I was really trying to do like more corporate event kind of stuff than wedding so much. And then, you know, and then March happened and then, you know, everything changed for me. So, you know, it was a big, you know, my, my business basically just imploded and was devastated um, by what happened in March. I'm just curious, like the people on the panel and some of the folks in the audience, I'm really curious, like how many people, how many of you guys are like self-employed or freelance? Yeah. And, and so like how many of you guys were like really adversely impacted by what happened in March? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, this, this was kind of a long time coming for me in a lot of ways. I mean, a lot of, I worn a lot of different hats in my life, you know, starting with kind of the photography thing. Um, I also, um, back in the mid nineties, I owned a small internet service provider company. And so actually this little space here, you know, I tell people I'm just a guy working in my basement, but this little space here in my basement back in the mid nineties, there was actually 300 modems in this space at one time. And so I had a, you know, a dial up ISP, you know, started it right here in the mothership in the basement. And, um, and so I could kind of had that kind of nerdy, like techie thing going for a long time. That was one of the things that kind of helped, you know, propel me into it and made it, made it an easier transition. And so, so how did you make that transition? So you, you've got, you're in a photography business. Uh, you're now moving into video. That seems like a big jump. Well, let me, let me talk about just kind of, let me talk about um, kind of the and photography have, stuff and by the way, a if you have, as, as Greg's talking, if you have questions, go ahead and stack them up in about uh, five or 10 minutes. We'll, we'll start asking him the, your questions. So go ahead and throw them in, but go ahead, Greg. Let me just, I just want to kind of backtrack a little bit and kind of, kind of talk a little bit about how I got into photography and some of the things that I did in the past and kind of how, you know, how everything kind of came together. So, you know, I have a few pictures I want to show. So um, let's see if you guys can see my screen here. So I did work in journalism. Um, I worked for the Associated Press uh, in Washington here. I was a staff photographer for the Associated Press and I covered the White House um, some. I was not, I didn't work for the White House. I worked in the media. And so this just kind of a funny picture. This is a picture of, um, this was the first time I ever went in the Oval Office and uh, when, not the first time I went in the Oval Office, but the first time I covered sort of a, an address by the president in the Oval Office. And at the end of the, when the president would make marks at the end of the event, they would always bring us in for like a photo op. And 
he talked about the drug problem in the U.S. And so I just thought it was kind of funny, like the first time I ever covered a major event in the Oval Office that the president pulled a bag of crack cocaine out of his desk drawer. <laughs> <laughs> he like, or, or something that simulated, I hope. <laughs> well, I mean, he was, hopefully he wasn't a user, but he was talking about how the drug problem was right across the street from the White House. And I always just kind of thought it was funny that that, that happened on the first, one of the first things I did at the White House. Right. And I, you know, I got to travel on Air Force One. So this is uh, the first flight of the 747 aircraft. And um, this is in the conference room. And that was um, President Bush. So we were on the way back from Helsinki, a summit in um, Helsinki with Gorbachev and President Bush, um, who was a very gracious um, president, invited all the press up into the conference room. And so we all kind of sat around the conference room and had drinks. And then he very graciously made sure that each of us got a full tour of the white of the airplane, including um, the upstairs part, which is where all the military is. And this is kind of I was walking in the door. Um, being greeted by President Clinton in the Oval Office back when I was a, a much younger man. It's like it almost looks like a previous lifetime. And I, I did other things, too. I covered the first Gulf War. Um, you know, so this was, uh, you know, in the in the Gulf, in the desert. This is out in one of the oil fields. That's an oil wall fire burning in the background. There was just all this munitions that were left over. And um, we used to go out there some nights just to kind of like look around and see what we could find. And there was all these weapons and tanks that were like fully armed and loaded. And so it was just, you know, a crazy time. And this was a picture that I made kind of early in my career. Uh, so this was one of the first trips that I did um, was, was actually the first trip I did as part of what's called the travel pool. So when you travel with the president there, there's actually 13 press that travel on the airplane or there used to be 13 press. It's probably changed a lot now, but there's 13 press that used to travel on the airplane with him and travel in the motorcade and sort of go everywhere the president goes. And you didn't necessarily always see what he did, but you were always just sort of nearby. Um, but so this was in um, this was in Budapest in the um, early 90s. So this is when um, Hungary and actually I'm going to show you another picture here uh, from Poland in just a minute. But this is when Hungary and Poland were both still communist countries. And President Bush was one of the first presidents to visit them um, as communist countries. And he just like the people were there were just overwhelmingly responded. And so he did this sort of impromptu jog out in the park one day and all these people just started running with him. And like there was this one frame where he put his arms out and he just looked like he was flying. And I was actually the only photographer that got that picture. And then the next day we went to Poland and we did this event with Lech Walesa and Gdansk and I, and I made this picture here. And what was significant about these two pictures is those two pictures ran on the front pages of the New York Times, the Washington Post and the LA Times on consecutive days. So it was kind of like first big score for me. Um, having come to Washington and what's really cool about it is, is my boss actually greeted me at the airplane steps the next day and um, congratulated me on that. And then I was fortunate to share a couple of Pulitzer Prizes. Um, the first one was for coverage of the 92 presidential campaign. And kind of the funny thing with President Bush is I actually liked Bush. He was just one of the nicest people you would ever meet personally. But every time he seemed to pick up a kid, the kid would start crying. And it even happened like one time when he, when I handed him my own kid, my own kid started crying. And so th and that was another, you know, kind of a difference between him and Clinton. This is another picture that was part of the Pulitzer package from 92, um, where Clinton just kind of had this way of sort of being able to relate to anybody and being able to kind of get down on the same level with anybody and kind of just had a very easy way of relating. And so this picture from the package was one of the images that was distributed as part of that. Now, now, my awards are group awards. I didn't win by myself, but um, this picture of mine was distributed as part of the media kit, as part of the sort of advertising package to kind of show off that, um, that award. And so I was always kind of proud of that. One kind of obscure little claim to fame, at least one that I claim, is I, I captured the first magazine cover that was ever captured with a digital camera. This has been October of 92. And this was from the first presidential debate. And while it's not maybe the best, greatest picture I ever shot, we were about 40 minutes ahead of everybody else because we used a digital camera. And so this was it's actually hard, the camera. I, I forgot this like, was, that it would be that, that would be the thing. Like I, the digital would be that much faster because you couldn't you had to develop it otherwise. Right. Right. And, it, and they always used to tell us that, um, you know, like for example, Newsweek was holding their cover and they always told us that it was about $250,000 an hour for them to hold the cover past deadline. And so, like I said, it wasn't like the best picture I ever shot. It was, we used only used that camera for the initial handshake. And so at a debate, at least in the old days, the way a debate used to work was all the, all the, um, um, 
all the participants would come out and they would greet each other at the front of the stage and they would shake hands and then they would go to their podiums and the debate would begin and they were never together again. So that initial picture was the only time you ever got them in the same frame together. And so this picture actually had them shaking hands at the bottom of it, but Newsweek chose to crop it out. But um, this is the camera that I used for it. This was, you know, like this was Kodak DCS 100 camera. It was a, like a half a megapixel camera. And it was a SCSI cable from the, it was a Kodak back. Kodak actually made the back and the, um, the shoulder pack. So the pack on the bottom was actually a shoulder pack, kind of like the old uh, video cameras that had a, you know, a separate recorder. And it was a SCSI connection from the camera to the um, recorder. And it, would, and it would capture one frame every one and a half seconds. And so when I was shooting this, this picture um, at the debate, it sounded like machine gun fire going off around me because all my colleagues were shooting, you know, film cameras at 10 frames a second. It was like, bang, 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 bang. And I was like, click, click. And the, and the funny thing was it with it is like, you could um, like you get in a rush and you start tapping the shutter button and the camera would accidentally fire. And then you'd have to wait like another second and a half to be able to shoot Jeez. another frame. Right. So I only so got, Greg, I, you know, I only had first. No, that was the first digital Newsweek ever ran. That was the first digital magazine cover that I that I'm aware of. So I ever. until somebody can prove me otherwise, I I claim having captured the first magazine cover ever shot with a digital digital camera. And one thing that's kind of interesting about the Kodak camera is, um, I had the opportunity a few years later to um, photograph the Kodak CEO from back then, and he said that. Um, he actually wasn't the CEO when this happened, but he was telling me he was on the board of directors and he used, he was telling me about at the board meetings, the heated discussions that Kodak had about whether or not to even launch this technology because they knew launching this technology was going to eventually kill their core product line. So, you know, if you were sitting on the board of directors at that company, imagine having those kind of conversations. And these are some pictures that I shot on election night in Arkansas with this uh, same camera. Again, uh, the quality is not very good on these particular images because they're, I, I don't have the original copies of them. These are actually what we call laser prints. So these are scans off of laser prints. And so these are just a few pictures that was shot on election night in 1992. And I was talking about a laser scan. So this is actually what uh, an old like wire transmission used to look like. This was a print, looked like a kind of like a fax. And that's actually President Clinton um, taking one in the face, <laughs> which is probably a good example of why, you know, a sitting president shouldn't get involved in, um, you know, outdoor yeah. sports in, a, in public. <laughs> and this is just a couple other cameras that we, um, you know, that we shot later in 1996. I was actually one of the first photographers to be fully equipped with a digital camera and a cell phone. And if you remember cell phones back then, they were like the size of a small briefcase and you could transmit at like 1200 baud. And so I have a lot of, um, recurring nightmares from trying to get pictures out back then on deadline. And those, uh, those discs, those PCM CIA discs, those were actually spinning platters. So if you dropped that disc after you had shot on it, you, you were toast because you would lose all your images. It would crash just like a hard drive. And in 1999, I did, um, you know, I was fortunate to share another Pulitzer Prize for coverage of the presidential impeachment and the Monica Lewinsky scandal. And, these are a few, just a few pictures that I shot as part of that story. Not all of these were included in that package, but these are some pictures that I shot. So this is just the first time that President Clinton was asked about Monica. It was during a cabinet meeting in front of all the cabinet. And, you know, Clinton, whenever he was angry, he would clench his jaw. And so you could just see those striations in his face. And so he was really, you know, not happy um, when he was asked about that for the first time in public. But he kind of just kind of went on and did, you know, it's kind of like business as usual until this day. And so when Clinton stood up in front of the cameras and said, I did not have sex with that woman, Miss Lewinsky, I was standing about 10 feet away from him. And I have to say, you know, at the time I really believed him. And I, sh this is a, in a room at the white house called the Roosevelt room. And um, on the, that's a portrait of Teddy, Teddy Roosevelt on the wall behind him. And Teddy Roosevelt at the time was the only president to ever won the Nobel peace prize. And so I framed this picture this way because I thought it was just kind of absurd that the president of the United States was having to kind of answer these questions while standing underneath the portrait of a president, perhaps maybe one of the most respected presidents we had ever had. And then this is Clinton getting serenaded by some African women kind of while the, while the debate was going on. 
And, you know, I used to every day, I would just kind of search Clinton's face for like signs of strain. And this was kind of like a little prayerful image that I made at the National Archives. And that's the Constitution, um, the U.S. Constitution in the frame behind them. And then this is the night that he said, well, I, I guess I did have sex with her. It really just kind of depends on how you define sex. And so that was kind of an odd situation because typically on a presidential address like this, they would bring us in after the remarks. But for this particular one, they brought us in at the beginning because they knew that if he finished, he was going to get up and leave and he was not going to wait for us to come in and photograph him. So they brought us in at the beginning. So this is um, his aide, Paul Begala, Paul Begala um, kind of getting him ready. And while we're in there, you could kind of see Clinton was getting his game face on. You know, he was trying. This was at the after the um, Ken Starr deposition. It was at the end of the day of the Ken Starr deposition. And so he made this address to the nation and. You know, you can really kind of see him trying to psych himself up and get his game face on. But the longer he sat there and the more kind of forlorn look kind of came across his face. And you really just kind of got a sense of kind of like how isolated and alone he was, even though he was president of the United States. And then um, a little while later, I think this was in August, he had to come out and um, he was impeached. Um, he wasn't impeached by the Congress. So he came out and made a statement of contrition that day. So this is kind of and we used to have this lens called the, um, it was a 35 to 350 Canon lens. We used to call it the street sweeper because it was such a wide, you know, such a wide focal length and it was really versatile, except it was like a four, five, five, six lens. But I used to use that a lot. And we had these cameras were one and a half crop body. So with that 350, it was really like a 500 millimeter lens. So you could just get in really, really tight with it. And this is um, on the day that he was acquitted. And this was my one encounter with Monica. Um, on the street. This was actually the only time I ever photographed her. And oddly enough, and it's kind of a long story and maybe I'll tell it in the post show if people want to join in the post show, but this was actually the day I decided to get out of journalism. So um, I didn't want to get like too far in the weeds on some of that stuff, but. Um, Interesting. So you decided that was enough. <laughs> like that was, that was enough of, of, of the, uh, of the circus, so to speak. I mean, the technical term I think is, is the circus. Um, the, exactly. Uh, there was a lot of manipulation that went on kind of in that. And mm -hmm. I'll, I'll tell you guys the story in the post show. I don't want to, I don't want to get, yep. I don't want to, I want to get more into the pivot. So, so. so then you, you pivoted, uh, you're doing, you're doing great. The whole thing stops. How do you, how did you start doing video? Like how did, how did you get? Well, here's the thing. So. And part of it is because I think it's important. I, you know, I normally wouldn't have you showing so much stuff from back. It's cool, a lot of cool gear though. And a lot of like, <laughs> interesting, you know, like I was like, I was like, but the other thing is important is I, I do think that that history also makes it easier because you you have connections, you have experience, you have, you understand processes and so on and so forth. So that helped probably a little bit, but even with all of that, going from one whole business to a whole another one, you know, it's kind of like fixing a train while it's still moving. Well, I mentioned that I um, that I started this internet service provider company. It started in 1994, and I actually right. ran that business and worked as a journalist full time. And I covered the 96 presidential campaign um, while running that business full time. And to be honest right. with you, if I'd been a little bit smarter and not covered the campaign and gone out and gotten a little bit of investment money, you know, we might be having a different conversation <laughs> right now. Right. Because, but you know, so actually, one of the reasons I left journalism not wasn't specifically Monica's fault, but another reason I left journalism was to sell that company. And so I was able to grow that up to about three thousand subscribers, and it wasn't like not quite big enough for the for the big payoff back then. But you know, I was able to get my money out of it, and I got a <laughs> I got a bunch of stock out of it, which you know was on the downslope from that point on. <laughs> but um, so I worked for that company for a couple of years until they ran out of money and fired us all or the company that hired, you know, that acquired my company. And then they ran out of money and fired us all. And um, a friend of mine kind of told me about this trend in wedding photography. So um, about um, documentary wedding photography. And he told me it was like a perfect fit for my skill set. So that's kind of where I went. I became a wedding and portrait photographer and started doing a lot of corporate events. And it just kind of like sort of built that business up. Right. And so, like I said, I was kind of transitioning more into corporate events and, um, you know, and then March 9th happened. And so um, I had, you know, zero previous experience in video, none. 
And so um, I was in Vegas, um, you know, and if I could kind of just kind of take you guys back to March, you know, last March, you know, I was in Vegas, I was at a conference, you know, it was a typical, you know, it was a little odd because we could kind of heard about this thing that was going on in China. And, um, you know, there were people from Asia who didn't come. It was a wedding the conference called wedding and portrait photographers international. And there were a lot of people from Asia that actually came to the conference, but there were a lot of people who didn't come from Asia because of this COVID thing that was going on. And there were some people, you know, who kind of took it seriously. Um, there were some people who didn't, but there was a lot of like shaking hands and hand and hugging still going on. And then there were people who would just kind of like give you a fist bump and, and kind of want to move on. And so I was there and then I came back. Um, I was back home for about a week and I went to the grocery store for the first time. And I had not like, I had been here. I, you know, when you're in Vegas, you're kind of like in a fantasy land and you're kind of like detached from reality. And then I came back and I went to the grocery store for the first time. This was the Wegmans. And I got to tell you, this was the meat department, you know, and the meat department was like wiped out and all the paper products were gone. And, you know, that, that whole experience like made my, made the hair on my arm stand up. And I started thinking, this is something that, you know, needs to be taken seriously. And I had had a couple of friends who had talked about having lost significant chunks of income over events canceling. It hadn't affected me yet until March 9th. So March 9th was the day I had three events cancel and there were three pretty big events. And then the next day I had three more events cancel. And then the next day I had three more events cancel. And so by the end of that week, I was unemployed for the next three, for the next three months. And then the following week I had the second wave happen. And by the end, within two weeks, I was unemployed for the foreseeable future. So I had, you know, zero prospect for income. Now, what happened that was interesting was on March 17th, I shot the last in-person event that I did. And um, it was, we were still under, we were under restriction. It was a 10 person limit. So it was all, it was just crew um, and talent and a couple of staff. So at the end of the event, into the event, the, um, and this was a company that I had, you know, and I want to say too, like about this whole thing, like I was totally not prepared for it. I, I had a lot of like long-term business relationships that were very casual, you know, people that I had done business with for, you know, 10 or 15 years. And, you know, it was like, they would call me up and say, Hey, Greg, can we going to have an event next Tuesday at 10 AM? Can you cover it? And I was like, sure. And then, so like, a lot of situations, there were no like formal contracts in place. So when cancellations started coming in, I wasn't covered by any kind of cancellation fee. Now all my wedding stuff, all my wedding stuff was covered. I was fine, but like the corporate stuff really hurt me in the short run. But um, so at the end of that event on March 17th, the president of that company who I worked with since 2003, he pulled me aside and he said, Hey, Greg, how, how are you doing? How are you holding up? You know, how's business going? He said, I know there, uh, we have a few people like you that are sort of ancillary folks. You're not staff, um, but you earn a significant chunk of income for us. So how are you getting along with it? And I told him, you know, you know, it was struggling. I was unemployed. You know, I, everything was canceling. And he said, you know, I want, I want you to know, we're going to take care of you. We're going to continue to find things for you to do. And I tell you, like, he was so sincere in it. Like it almost made me, like, I almost got emotional about it when we were talking. And then the VP of communications was standing there with them. And he said, you know, we have this thing, you know, we, we're a think tank. We're in a pandemic. This is our wheelhouse. we got to be able to get our message out. So we have this issue that we're not able to bring in more than one remote guest at a time. And so if you can help us solve this problem we have of being able to bring in multiple remote panelists, there's an opportunity for you. And so, you know, he didn't have to tell me twice. So I went home that night. I hit the computer. I hit, I hit my Google machine. Uh, I, you know, did a lot of research and, you know, how can I bring in remote panelists? I didn't know anything about Zoom. I had zero, zero video production experience prior to this. And um, so I found this thing called vMix and this thing called vMix Call. And so I looked at it. You could bring in eight people, you know, all good. Okay. And it was highly, you know, vMix was, I was a Mac guy. So I really was sort of more interested in Wirecast and Wirecast sort of had, you know, something called Rendezvous. And um, 
I could never get it to work. I was going to say, you tested that and then you said, I, I can't run it. a business on this. Yeah. It's like, it's horrible. Yeah. And let, let me tell you, just tell you one other thing. Like one thing that VMix did was they, like I, I downloaded VMix on August the 18th or March the 18th. They extended their trial period for 90 days, like right for that day. So you could download VMix and you could use it free of charge for 90 days. I downloaded Wirecast and like the next day, like it was the 19th and I had a 30, it was a 30 day trial period with them and I couldn't get the rendezvous thing to work. So I called their tech support and they called me back in the afternoon. So I had just launched, you know, Wirecast that morning. And when, when the tech support person finally called me back and I launched Wirecast again, I noticed that my trial period had dropped from 29 days to 14 days. So I mean, come on, you know, I got one company that's given me a 90 day extension, which was really mm -hmm. smart. And I got another company now that's going to take 14 days from me after I've already downloaded the program. So, you know, VMix became the winner. But so anyway, at 515 in the morning, I emailed the VP of communication said, I've got a, I have a solution for you. And, you know, somewhere later that morning, he rent me back and said, that's great. Let's talk about it. Um, later this afternoon, I've got some meetings. And then what happened was, is somewhere between those messages they decided that they had figured out a solution for themselves and they were just going to kind of keep doing what they were doing. So it didn't happen initially, you know, so I was kind of like, I was frustrated and a little disappointed about it, but you know what I did, Alex, is I decided that if there was truly going to be kind of opportunity in this crisis that I made educating myself on video, video production, my full-time job. So it's kind of funny. Like I used to joke with my wife, I have like my little, like, coffee thermos and it has a handle on it. So I used to tell her I was like taking my lunch pail and I was going down to work. And so I'd come down here in the basement. I have a little basement office on the, around the corner and eight hours a day for three months, I came down here and I looked at, I watched every YouTube video I could find. I read as much information as I could find. And, you know, I did everything I could do to, to learn media production. Now the problem was, and the other thing I did too was, you know, I started, well, I had to build I had to build something that I could show, right? So I couldn't just go to people and say, hey, I can do media production. So one of the things that I started doing was I started kind of um, producing some of my own events. And so I self-produced a few events. Uh, so, you know, one of the big things that was going on at that time, as I mentioned, was we were hit with this, photographers were hit with this wave of um, cancellations and, postponements and a lot of photographers were sort of in turmoil about how to handle those issues. So two days after I downloaded VMix, I did my very first live stream program. And I did a program with a business, a photography business expert and a lawyer who had been a photographer who understood the business of photography. And so I did one on legal issues facing photographers, contracts and retainers. And so this is kind of like where I started. This was in my, in my smaller office. So um, for those of you who are Facebook friends with me and have heard me kind of talk about the mothership, which is kind of what I've affectionately named my little production space here. This is, this was kind of the beginning of the mothership. And, um, you know, that's kind of like the early thing there. And so I did, and that's kind of like what the mothership has morphed into now. <laughs> but, um, so I did a couple of, you know, I did like three or four shows and, and on April 10th or kind of early April, I had this idea about, um, you know, hey, this pandemic is something that has affected everybody around the world in very much the same way. And wow, wouldn't it be cool if we could get a bunch of photographers on from different countries and actually talk about it? You know, we've heard, you know, photographers or, or colleagues be affected by issues um, before, but, you know, everybody had never been sort of enveloped in sort of the same crisis. And so I did this show. I had 10 photographers on from around the world. Um, I thought it was pretty cool and clever at the time. Um, you know, I had people on from Australia, from Taiwan, Japan, the U S the UK, uh, Italy, and, you know, and they all talked very honestly and candidly about, um, you know, what was going on with them. And one thing that I did learn, like, is that, you know, having 10 people on is, is pretty challenging. And Alex, I understand why you're such a strict moderator, because man, when you get 10 people on and photographers in particular like to talk as I'm probably talking too much right now. Um, but this thing went on for like four hours. Right. And I did another one with the, 
a friend of mine, uh, Doug Mills, who's a White House photographer, he did one on just sort of um, how um, the pandemic was affecting um, coverage at the White House and the social distancing measures that were that were put in place there. And this is just kind of um, me doing this show with Doug. And then uh, I also um, volunteered to do some streams for a group called the International League of Conservation Photographers. So I did um, I did five programs for them for free. And that's, you know, kind of how I got some well, experience. It's, it's the thing that I, uh, oftentimes when you're going into something, you know, I, I often, uh, people have heard me say that, you know, free is the straw that drank a thousand milkshakes. And, you know, a lot of how I get into something when I'm trying to figure it out is how do I, you know, do it for myself? Then how do I do it for someone else for free? And you're building up your capacity, but you're also letting people see what it is. And then you start turning that corner and start turning it into something. I'm going to ask a couple of questions because we've got a couple stacking up. I want to make sure that we get to the top of the hour for it. And sure. I'm sure you can weave in the other stuff there. Um, go ahead. Uh, I'll, I'll ask these ones. We'll just go. We'll go through it real quick. Uh, uh, Jonas uh, Tatel uh, asks, how did you land your first few jobs? Well, that's actually kind of like where we're going. So that's actually a pretty timely question. So initially, I really kicked myself hard, Alex, about not having that previous video experience. You know, I was thinking like, man, I'm so far behind the curve. All these people that have all this video experience, they're going to they're going to dominate the market and I'm never going to catch up. And what I discovered was that, um, first of all, the virtual event space was it's a new skill set. And even people who have, were well versed in video production, it was a new set of skills for them as well. And so we were all sort of like learning this thing together. And the other thing that I learned was that, you know, companies kind of had to go through the Zoom phase, Right you know, virtual production had been sort of like witchcraft and black magic and voodoo for a lot of people. And now all of a sudden they're thrown into it. It's shoved down their throat. And if you can't figure out, you know, how to do virtual um, stuff, you know, you're not going to be able to do business on a day-to-day -day basis. And so what I found was a lot of people just kind of had to go through the Zoom phase. They had to see like what could be done there. And then they started to want more. And that's kind of what happened going back to that other client who told me there was an opportunity there because they went, they were doing a bunch of events in zoom. And so, and I, I kept in communication with them and was kind of like, as I did things was kind of letting them know what I was doing and how I could do those things differently. And so back in June, they came to me and they said, okay, you know, we want to take a look at what you're doing. Can we get a demo? So I did a demo with them in early June and they hired me to do three events on a trial basis in June. And those all went pretty well. And they decided that um, they told me in July, we're going to give you all of our events. We're going to do 19 events in July. Can you handle that? Do you think you can handle that? And I was like, I don't know, but we're going <laughs> to, you know, we're yeah. going to give it a shot. And um, so that's kind of how, you know, that's kind of how it got that's going. Right. And I decided that I was going to make July and August. I was just going to focus on the events for that specific group. I ended up doing 19 events in July, 19 events in August. And then in September, once I had sort of built a solid body of work that I could share, then I started reaching out to my other, my former um, corporate contacts and started showing them what I was doing. And then it's kind of started to snowball and take off again. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, I think that the hard part for Zoom was that low resolution when people were doing just a broadcast over Zoom. Mm -hmm you lost all the interactivity because they didn't understand how to ask questions or interact with people the way we do here, but you also didn't have any resolution. <laughs> and so the two of those to combined was the problem. They didn't know how to use it and they didn't have any, any video quality. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Shirag uh, asks, Greg, what uh, has been the biggest challenge for you facing being a one man show? Uh, a lot of it is just like the sheer volume of work. You know, I've had a lot of night because look, the thing with virtual production is pre-production yeah. in photography and video. A lot of it is post-production and with virtual, if you don't have the pre-production done, the show doesn't happen or, you know, or at least the show doesn't look right. And I have like, like my like recurring nightmare is that I'm going to wake up late one day and I'm going to have like a string of emails from some client whose event that I didn't put on my calendar. And now they're like, they're trying to log in. They can't get logged in and I don't have their show. I don't have their show ready. So that, that's, I think, been the biggest challenge. People ask me a lot of times because I, I am sort of the quintessential uh, solo producer. I work by myself for the most part. Um, a lot of people do ask me, like, like, what level, what's the level of work that you're doing once you're actually in a production? And, you know, most of the work and most of the stress is the 
hour leading up to the event. And then once the event gets going, it's actually not a ton of, you know, you know I'm not going to say it's not work because a lot of stuff to monitor, but you know, at that point, it's more about just making sure that you follow the show flow and you make the cuts and that people that, you know, the right people are on the screen at the right time and their audio is working. All right. Next question is from George Kennedy. Greg, is the mothership fu uh, fully flying in the AWS cloud? The mothership is um, fully flying in the AWS cloud. Um, thanks to people like Jeff Keithley and Tucker, you know, just talking about the community here. I had a um, pretty big event last week that was a large kind of a large lift for me. I know for a lot of you guys, it's not a big deal, but for me, um, we were doing something new. We were doing it in the cloud. Um, I had a panel of four and a panel of five, and we were going to put the panels in different breakout rooms. And so we had a green room. So when people logged in, we could greet them and kind of do their tech check and then move them, move the panels into their, um, you know, into their breakouts. I was using Unity to communicate with everybody in each room, not necessarily just monitoring it through vMix. So that was all new for me. And I had, you know, a few people help me, you know, Guy, for example, and Chirig all helped me kind of test it the night before. And then Chirig, Chirig actually mentioned, hey, you know, I've got some time tomorrow morning. So once you get this thing set up, if you need some help, you want to run through it, give me a call. So I sent him a note in the morning and he logs in and we're going through it. And then the next thing I know, here comes Tucker. Tucker's logging in. Chirig sent him a message. So Tucker's logging in and Tucker's getting in his car. And then a few minutes later, here comes Guy and Guy logs in to help me do the test. And Guy's on the trip, you know, on the uh, elliptical. And, you know, with that kind of help and support, you know, how can you go wrong? I think that that's been one of the things that's really worked here is that it's, it's just that we've attracted a lot of people who are uh, really out to help each other you know, and not, and, and it's, and really out to like, when we, when we ride, when all boats rise together, you know, and when we're helping each other, that all makes it, makes it, it makes it all better for all of us, <laughs> you know? And so, so it's, it's an amazing thing. Yeah. Go and ahead, there's Greg. a tendency, there's a tendency sometimes I think to want to hoard information because, you know, yeah. you don't want to like share what you're doing with your competition or you're afraid you're going to enable your competition. And, you know, why do you want to help everybody else? But I think what happens is when you do share the information, you get back as much as you give yeah. and, that's one of the things that's been just so beneficial about all this, Alex. Yeah, no, I, I, I hoarded it with Hangouts. I just hoarded all the information because I had a payroll to make. <laughs> you know, like I was, ter I was like terrified yeah. of having to change, and uh, you know, so we kept it. It was super secret, and we, you know, damaged the whole industry by doing that because we had learned. You know, Google had essentially paid twenty million dollars to train us, and then, you know, with all these events, and then we just weren't. <laughs> little, little drops would come out the other end and then by the end i was saying hey i'm happy to t t train anybody because i could see i could see that all the events failing you know like that, that we weren't doing and i was like i gotta suddenly it was too late but i had i could see things falling off the cliff because i hadn't we hadn't been doing live streams talking about what we do so it's, it's good. um chad lafarge says greg uh, you work with high profile personalities how do you negotiate tech checks or what do you do to find challenging what or what do you find challenging about preparing people <laughs> you work with when they um, are behind layers of associates and assistants well chad chad has heard me complain about this a lot so he knows that that's a question that's near and dear to my heart and you know alex i don't i don't get like the level of um access to a lot of people that i have on you know like you do and so there's a lot of times i don't even you know i, I deal with a lot of members of congress um you know high ranking government officials, fortune 100 CEOs, typically, you know, a lot of times I'm dealing with an assistant who may not necessarily even be in the same location that the person is going to be presenting from. And, um, so a lot of, a lot of what I do is just sort of like, you know, you're, you're kind of at the mercy of what they have. And so all you can do is just sort of try to establish those best practices and, and then it is what it is. Yeah. It's a hard, hard nut <laughs> a lot of times what we do is we use uh you know when you're in a police i'm not i have not, not been interrogated by a police department but when you watch the when you watch law and order and they say you know i'm gonna go to, i'm gonna go talk to frank and if frank tells me the, the story i'm not gonna make you a deal i use that with with executives going well we sent a kid out to everybody you know like they i don't want to use it or, or we did i don't want to do a meeting I'm like, well we're meeting with everybody else and we just don't we just want to make sure that you're up to par you know with everybody else and you don't look bad and, and then well, one, about half the time they go oh, okay okay we'll, we'll we'll figure that out go ahead greg well what well, i was gonna say one of the things i try to do is i try to sort of like set the tone by being a good example so yeah. i typically try to i don't always have everything kind of lit up and set up the same way that i have it set up for this but i typically you know try to look good and sound good yeah. try to set the bar 
Um, and then, and then typically like we don't, we rarely kind of do tech check individually. Like a lot of times we do end up in group, um, right. tech checks. And I understand like Alice, I understand like, and I've heard you say, um, we have our way of doing of, it. You kind of put people just... on the spot. You kind of put people on the spot when you do it that way. And right. some people kind of can respond to it and some people don't. And, well, um, but what we do find is we do get sometimes a little bit of peer pressure. And so, you know, like somebody comes in and they don't have a good setup and they see like kind of what everybody else is doing, then they'll make that change. Now, one thing I will say, I do a lot of stuff in VMix call and I do more stuff. Uh, I'm doing more stuff in Zoom now uh, as well. But I do find kind of that um, people respond to VMix call a little bit differently than they do to Zoom in that they typically will take VMix call a little bit more seriously. So like what, what I'll do is I kind of go into it and I'll explain to them that we're really looking for a higher production value, right? And I show them kind of the screens that we're going to use and I try to get them to sort of buy into the whole thing. Right. And so um, I explain to them it's going to look more like a TV talk show. And because, I don't know if it's because VMix call is maybe less familiar to them and Zoom is something that they do, they're so familiar with, they do it almost every single right. day that they don't take it as seriously. And so I'll get the people and, you know, one problem I never have in VMix call is I never have somebody come in with a virtual background. So typically with Zoom, you know, I always get somebody that comes in with just a really bad virtual background. <laughs> it's like, and and this is what got, they use all know, the time. This is what they use all the time. That's what you hear. I, this is what I high level government official or a VIP and you're trying to politely dissuade them from wanting to use that virtual background. You know, it gets tricky. I find it so frustrating that I can't turn that off. As a, as an owner of the of the event, I should be able to turn off virtual virtual backgrounds. Anyway, I, uh, I feel your pain. Yeah. Uh, next question is from Chad. Uh, from I'm sorry, from Alex uh, Forty Goldner. He said, "How do you organize your archive of photos?" <laughs> uh, what archive? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, Noah Sargent uh, from Fullerton said, uh, was learning the IT networking side of streaming more challenging than learning photography lighting techniques? You know, it's like, it's like learning a different language in a lot of ways. And, you know, one of the things Tucker mentioned to me when he was, when I was working with him on cloud production, it's really kind of like muscle memory. So cloud production was very like unintuitive to me. So when I first started jumping into cloud, it was really hard. It was really difficult. And I got to tell you something like when you do your first cloud event, it is a gigantic leap of faith to, right. to proceed with that and hang it out there for your client. And you can't touch or feel that machine. And if something goes wrong with that machine, it's not like a simple button that you can fix. So um, it was basically just kind of like learning the language and then sort of like exercising the muscles. And that, mm -hmm. that was one of the reasons why I did, you know, I did 15 virtual events of my own or, right. you know, or, for freebies that I did for, you know, that other organization before I ever actually did one that I was actually getting paid for. Yeah, absolutely. I, it's a key, key to the process. Uh, but haven't, but, but like I had a little bit of the IT, the IP background from only the internet service provider company. So, you know, the whole thing with IP addresses and a lot of that stuff was, you know, that wasn't that foreign, but things like, you know, bit rate and frame rate and all that stuff, that was, you know, that was a different language. <laughs> Wouter, uh, Cola, uh, Colo, Colowin, I believe. Uh, and again, you in your profile, you can put pronunciations of your names uh, so that we can we can hit it a little harder. Uh, next to vMix, what are the other software packages that are important to you? Uh, Zoom. Um, you know, I got 1080 access to Zoom back in um, September. So do a lot of that. Um, you know, my cloud presence is very important to me now. When do you choose Zoom versus vMix when you're when you're connecting? A lot of times it depends on the client, you know? Um, so like one client I do a lot of events with, we typically will do a lot of stuff in vMix call and that works really well. We have a lot of sort of granular control in vMix call. And I just want to say, like, I think vMix call kind of gets a little bit of a bad rap. It actually works pretty well now. Uh, it's been improved quite a lot. And one of the things that I have found with vMix call, um, well, you know, one of the very first events that I did um, was with a member of Congress. It was like the third or fourth event that I did. And the first test session that I did with them, I did it with one of their staffers and that, that member could not log in to vMix call. And I was like, oh my God, I've got I've to come up with some kind of solution here because man, if I can't get this guy on, like this whole thing is not gonna, this puts the whole 
operation in jeopardy. And I had a friend that was a staffer um, up there. And so I did some tests with him and I was actually able to um, using vMix call, using the beta vMix call, which is now the advanced vMix call site for whatever reason that was able to navigate the the government VPN. And so I've never actually had much difficulty getting people that are using the government VPN connected. Now I've had difficulty on occasion with other people, but typically like the issues with vMix call tend to be um, operator error where people just have too much stuff going on in their computer. They're using the wrong web browser. And then the new vMix call too, like one of the really nice things is it one of the early criticisms of vMix call was that it was very difficult to change the devices if the devices weren't correct. And now that's actually, you can do that right in the browser interface, but we'll use Zoom typically based on how many people we have. Um, I tend to use Zoom, you know, a lot more now because I do have the 1080 access. So if I have people that are gonna be using 1080 cameras that have that um, capability, um, you know, I'll, I'll go that way. Next question is from George Kennedy. He said, how was your photography eye for timing translated to switching video content? I mean, I think that's actually a really good question, George. And I don't, I don't think it, like, I don't think the eye, like, obviously I have an eye for composition and, you know, um, I can, I know how to coach people to kind of make them get their setups a little bit better. One of the things that, you know, people have told me is that my events just look really nice. And I think a lot of it is, is, um, comes from having sort of some page layout and some graphic design experience. You know, I did album, you know, album design for my wedding clients. And so I think how you can kind of arrange people in a grid on a screen makes a big difference. And so I think, you know, if I had any kind of a strength in that area, I think that's kind of where the photography thing has helped me the most is just in sort of like being able to sort of arrange, you know, a group of three or a group of four, a group of five or a group of nine on a screen and make it coherent. Sky Gleason asks, he said, pivot, where and who is your, is your community that fit into your change? I don't know exactly how to. Um, hmm. I'm not sure exactly what Sky's asking me there, but I mean, right. I mean, obviously, you know, the client that gave me the opportunity, um, right. Right. you know, the people here that I've already mentioned, um, you know, you know, like, I don't want to start naming a lot of names, but I am going to name Chad because Chad is actually one of the very first people that I reached out to. Um, and I knew, I knew Chad through the um, vMix forum on Facebook, the user group. And Chad was always really helpful when people ask questions. And so I can't even remember what the specific question was that I had for Chad, but I sent him a note on Messenger one day and I said, hey, you've always been really helpful. I've got this particular problem. Can you help me solve it? And my gosh, like he like embraced it. And he not only helped me solve it, but then he like showed me how to do scripting and he sent me a bunch of scripts and he like just being able to like change like the talk back. I was doing a talk back shortcut in vMix that was like 16 steps and it was a nightmare to program. And then Chad showed me how to script that and that, oh my God, that just changed my life. So Chad, Chad was hugely uh, influential on me and, and somebody that I, uh, you know, remain in contact with almost every single day, you know, a guy and cheer rig and Tucker and those people have well have become, you know, very um, influential in what I do day to day. Oh, that's great. Next question is uh, from Shane Foley in Ashland, Oregon. He said, as a solo operator, what do you choose to outsource to other contractors? And what do you wrangle yourself? I outsource nothing. Wow. So I do it all <laughs> myself. Now, that is, that is a lot of work. I have, I have um, had situations where I've had some overlap. And so I have, you know, had a couple of people come in and help me out with other events. Um, you know, if I've had an overlapping start time or whatever. Um, so I have, you know, and, and that's the other thing too, like, hey, uh, it has snowballed a bit. I do, you know, continue. I do, you know, 20 to 30 events a month now. Um, as I mentioned, I've done like something like 225 events since July. So I am starting to get into that whole thing where it's got to become more than just me. And so I am, you know, looking at ways that I can start to scale it. You know, the cloud infrastructure is kind of one of those ways that, you know, I can bring somebody else on that could, you know, manage an event for me uh, from their home and not have to, you know, physically come here. So I, I am starting to explore those things, but 
right now, man, it's just me. I do it all. I do the tech checks. I do the, you know, the, do the green room. I do the switching. I do it all. That's crazy. I do the design. Wow. Uh, the, you just gotta stay healthy because <laughs> there's a lot, a lot of shows. <laughs> okay. That's a, yeah, that's a, that's a significant thing. And I think about that a lot and, and to be honest with you, like, I don't see a lot outside of these walls anyway, because I'm so <laughs> busy with work. I feel like I'm chained yeah. to this, you know, this desk, desk so much, but I mean, I yeah. do get out every day. You know, I try to get a five mile run or a walk in, um, that's right. Alex back in March. You know, those five mile walks were very instrumental for me when I just had to get out and kind of think about things. And I, I've mentioned this, this to you before, you know, I first heard you on the photo of Joseph last right. March and I, and it turns out I actually went back um, a couple of days ago and I listened to that event again, because I just wanted to have it fresh in my mind for today. And it turns out that it was uh, Fenwick and Felipe and a couple other people that you were on that program with. And that was a very, you know, like that program gave me a lot of good information, gave me a lot of a good feeling and really inspired me to keep moving forward. And, and, you know, going back to that time, I got to tell you, I mean, once, once the client told me, you know, they were going to kind of stick with the, what they had and they weren't going to kind of move forward with what I mm -hmm. had to offer with them. I mean, I was kind of thinking to myself, Oh my God, what am I going to do? I'm 58 years old. I'm not a demographic that is in high demand, you know, like it or not. Yeah. And it is what it is. Um, I started thinking, you know, can I work, can I drive an Uber? Can I bag groceries? Right. You know, what am I going to do? I had a lot of sleepless, sleepless nights. You know, I had to resort to sleep aids some nights to just, you know, just get some sleep. And so, um, yeah, no, yeah, it was challenging times. You get into those moments and you just, yeah, because I, I had to close my company and it was kind of a big thing like that where you just, but I, 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 I question myself. Yeah. I, well, I questioned myself. I sat down here many days, you know, doing, looking at those videos, watching those videos, wondering if maybe I should be doing something else with whether I was actually spending my time in a right. worthwhile way. You know, I had a friend, um, Paul Giroux started this thing called Porch Portraits, and he had this project called Portraits in the Time of Corona, where he would go out and, you know, schedule these portrait sessions with his neighbors, and they would come out on their porch and, or, right. you know, behind their screen door, and he would shoot them in a socially distanced fashion. And then I had another friend, Matt Mendelson in Arlington started this project called Not Forgotten, which he did a, um, a senior portrait and told a story for each and every senior at his daughter's high school. And he just felt like these kids got shortchanged that they missed out on a rite of passage. And so he, he had this really cool project and my, my God, they got huge. They got tons of publicity on this stuff. Matt was on the today show. And you're CBS sitting there working away watching news. YouTube videos. And I'm sitting down here looking at freaking videos on, you know, GT title yeah. designer and VMix call. Right. And I'm thinking maybe I'd be better spent, time is better spent, you know, using my camera so that whenever this does end, at least maybe I'll have some kind of word of mouth or advertising bump out of it. Right. And yeah. Now I'm glad but I didn't. Turned. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hard. It's hard. Uh, Dorian Robinson, and we're going to have to move kind of quickly because we're uh, running out of time. Um, Dorian uh, said, what SLR uh, uh, gives you the reasonable balance between photo and video? I think um, the new, like it's a little pricey, but the new Sony A1, I'm a Sony person. So, I mean, I'm not, I have no official relationship with Sony, but I love Sony gear. Um, right. They just came out with a new camera, A1. It does uh, 8K video. They've got a, a less expensive version uh, of the camera called the A7S 3 which is a great video camera for DSLR. It does a lot of really cool stuff, especially with high ISO. The A1 is pretty much everything that the uh, a7s3 is but also in a 50 megapixel camera so it's a great still camera and it's a great video camera that's great uh aaron uh uh hustledge says uh not a question he said i just want to say how much your story resonates with me and i'm in the middle of a pivot as well thank you for sharing no oh, that's great well i mean i my gosh i i'm so flattered i would never if you'd asked me a year ago if i'd be sitting in front of all of you folks talking about things you know that i've been doing i i'm just floored uh gert uh majay uh, majay um from out everett lee is says uh, do you send equipment to the guests or do they use their own camera and sound no we 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 don't typically don't have the budget to send gear to guests so i think what do you call it alex you call it a best best effort best so effort pretty yeah. much everything we do is pretty much a best effort so we try yes. to make the best do the best we can with what we have to work with that's rough 
<laughs> like it's just that's a hard that's a hard life um carl maxer from new york says what sort of internet connectivity do you have in your home studio i mean that, that's a good question so you know i was talking about all the little um decisions that kind of went in or things that happened in my life to kind of make this happen there were a couple of decisions that happened kind of by happenstance like for example in january last year we upgraded our home internet to gigabit fiber so i have 940 up 940 down the other kind of cool thing that happened was I picked up this little thing. I was getting ready to do a, a workshop series called Unleash Your Alpha. And I picked up this little ATEM. I had no idea what it was. I picked up this little ATEM Mini. This is actually a pro, the pro, but the Mini's here running my camera. I picked it up to use it for the workshop to be able to switch between my laptop and my camera menus and my phone screen on the projector. And I picked it up in February. And then as you know, I'm sure everybody else here knows, March, April, you could not find those things, nor could you find any kind of an HDMI capture device or a web camera. And yeah. so had I not like made those two things happen, like, you know, the whole project yeah. might never have happened. Wow. Uh, Shane Foley in Ashland also says, Greg, uh, would you mind describing the pre-production steps you take with corporate clients? What is the pre-production to live uh, show ratio? Pre-production to live ratio. I guess it's the amount of time you spend on it. So it's like, how many hours in pre-production do you spend for a, like a one hour show? Uh, I mean, it's hard to say, you know, sometimes it depends on how much, like, like if it's, if it's a new client, it's a lot more time because we have to build the screens. We have to build the grids, mm -hmm. have to add all the graphics. We have to do all the lower thirds. So, you know, and I do all of that. I do try to get the clients to give me a basic 1920 by 1080 um, background graphic with their branding on it, you know, push to the edge somewhere that we can add in. Uh, but, you know, a new client, I might take a full day or more of pre-production time. Um, right. You know, people that I work with, you know, we tend to build up a library of assets over time. So like a few clients that I have that I, that do a lot of stuff, it takes a little bit less time. It still takes time because you have to kind of go in and, and assign people to the proper grids and get all the lower thirds information right. Um, but it does take less time the more you do with, with a particular client because you do kind of build up that library of assets. Yeah, that's great. Um, Alex Foldy, Forty Goldner has the last question. Do you have plans to train someone to cover the work that you cannot do? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It does get, it, it gets hard. It gets hard because you, you don't want to turn work <laughs> down either. Like, so you do, you know, you get to a point where you have too many conflicts, so. Exactly. So, I, and, I, and I, that's the thing. I'm trying not to turn anything away. I try never to send, like one thing I learned in photography is never to send a potential client to somebody else right. because if if that's not already your client they're and you send them to somebody else then they're going to become somebody else's client so i've always tried to like sub out work or try mm -hmm. to find a way to kind of keep things in-house yeah so alex i know we're kind of out of time i just wanted to like really quickly kind of um just kind of quickly show a yeah, couple of things absolutely. here so like this was from the first event this is kind of like how the mothership originated um this is just my was my little like basement workspace this is kind of how it started when i when i first got going back in july i started with a laptop computer um one of the things that was really important to me was being able to like make it work with gear that i had because i didn't have any budget to um to be able to go out and spend on gear and i did buy end up buying some microphones and stuff like that but pretty much like when i started i had to do it with computer equipment that i had so this is just um I did a very big um, workshop for a um, photojournalism workshop. It was sort of the biggest lift that I had done up until that. This was mid-September. This was like an eight-hour event, and I did it for sponsorship. They didn't have a budget for it. I got into it kind of late, and they were um, they took me on as a sponsor. They kind of like I didn't really know any of the people, and they kind of like liked what I was doing and gave me an opportunity to do it. And it, this having done this thing as a sponsorship has actually paid off because I've actually gotten quite a lot of business out of that. And then, you know, things started to snowball kind of in October. So we added another machine. I bought a machine off one of my kids and then I got my 1080 uh, zoom access <laughs> for both webinar and um, meeting. And then I, the first opportunity I got to be able to, um, put it in to practice was I did this event with Dr. Fauci for this group called Survivor Corps. And um, so this was kind of the setup on it. You see Dr. Fauci was on that. I had Dr. Fauci on the monitor to my right. That was a 4K monitor. And you see I was getting 1080. It was 
um, from I was sending and receiving 1080. And I shot this picture with my phone. It's just of my monitor that's sitting here to my right. But like at 1080, like the quality difference was so unbelievable. It felt literally like he was like right there sitting next to me. Right. And then, and that's the Fauci event on my big screen TV. And then just kind of like keeping growing the thing and the whole like solo producer. And then I had um, in December, I did an event that was actually broadcast on Yahoo Finance. It was kind of cool because it was actually broadcast live on their channel. So we actually had like commercial breaks and everything. I had to send them an SRT feed. Now I've, I've had a lot of events um, on Yahoo Finance. I've had a lot of events on C-SPAN as well. Um, but this was the first event that I had done where I actually had to send them a feed and we had the whole commercial breaks thing that we had to factor in. And so we had to use comms and stuff like that. And then this is kind of like, we added another, you know, two more machines. So the mothership kind of kept growing and that's kind of what it looks like now. And then this was an event I did a couple of weeks ago with the um, secretary of energy. And then George was asking about cloud production. So this is actually a cloud set up. It's a, it's a bit messy, but the three monitors that are on the left, that's actually um, four machines in the cloud running on one computer. And then I've got a Teradici instance of vMix running on the four screens on the right. So I've done about, I don't know, about 15 events in the cloud now. So that's awesome. That's kind of it. So from zero to 225 and now I'm, now I'm working in the cloud and, and this I can, opportunity to, to sit here and chat with all of you guys and talk about, you know, things I've been doing. Like this is like a highlight of my career, a highlight of my life here. So I appreciate it. Well, I really I appreciate, appreciate you coming on. I, I, I just, it's just such, such a great, I just thought it was just such a great story and you're such a great guy. We, we just, we just, all, <laughs> you know, we like it when you come on you were just, so it's just, it, it just, uh, you know, we just really wanted to, um, I think it inspires a lot of people. I think there's still a lot of people in the mi middle of a pivot, you know, and I think that having them, you know, I think it's important for people to, to see that the, that the, that there is light on the other side, that, that there, there is worth. And, and I think for us to also let people know that it's part of why I created this. You know, like where or why I started this was to help mm -hmm. people figure this pivot out because I was, you know, is is figure out how do we make make sure that people have the data that they need to make it work, you know, and and you taking it all the way, you know, down well, down that path. So I, I can't wait to have the you know you and your fifty employoys next year. We'll do it again next year. We'll do, <laughs> that's okay. You know, you'll have, but they'll be all over the world. They they won't be like all in DC. They'll, you'll just have this the the the, the Gibson uh, cloud of 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 people you know doing stuff. That's what I hope. You know, I hope to see, uh, hope to see it keep growing. I hope you're right, Alex. Yeah. yeah so <laughs> great. Just great. Greg, work, are you right? in Discord? I am in Discord. Yeah. Cool. So if anybody okay. has any questions, we didn't get it to anything. I you couldn't know, find you. Could you send me, really hit me up? Super loud, Chris. Um, and uh, the, uh, yeah, but I think that it's such a great lesson in just keeping your legs moving. You know, like that's a big like you know the uh for the for the 10 seconds that i was a running back that was the big thing is you just when someone tackles you just got to keep moving your legs like do not stop you know and i think that i think all of us you know especially when everything is pulled out tends to stop and tend to not you know be able to turn forward i think it's it's really hard so just congratulations you know it's well and, not, and alex you know i you know as you say and, and what I hear from the people that I work with, you know, the virtual stuff, it's not going away. You know, the people that I oh, yeah. work with, they see, they get more eyes on product. They get higher audience engagement than they ever thought possible. Yep. So I don't, you know, I don't see it going away anytime soon. I think it's only going to get bigger. Like this is, you know, because it's in the end, you have a better chance of engagement, a better chance of uh, spreading all over the world, you know, and, and it's just, it's, it's going to be, we're, we're just, just at the very beginning. So so um, anyway, so thank you so much for coming to share your story. Uh, it was Thanks just for having me. Thank you guys. Really, really great. It. Yeah, you thank were you were well. kind of this mis mysterious Greg Gibson who was getting 1080p <laughs> and doing all these things. I was like, who is this guy? Who is this guy? And and so it's it's fine. It's it's good to be able to sit down with you and and walk through it. So um, well, so hopefully I can. You know, like I told you, it's hard. Like 10 a.m. on a weekday is kind of a difficult time. You know, given the volume of work that I'm doing. But I yeah. now that I've kind of like been through the process and I've gotten the Mickey thumbs up on the, uh, on the audio chain, then I'll, um, maybe I'll try to jump in a little more often.
Okay, awesome. No, it'd be, it'd be great to have you when, 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 it, when it makes sense. Uh, for everyone, remember, I just want to warn the panelists that tomorrow is Ruthless Review of your audio chain. Um, this is not going to be like a, your mic check. This is going to be digging deep into everything we can hear about your, your mic. So that'll be, a, it'll, be a, it'll be interesting. So I encourage you to come. Um, and, uh, and then also make sure to look at Saturday. <laughs> and, and, and Saturday night is going to, it turns out to be a lot of fun. I don't know how many, how many people went to the Saturday, to Mad in the Kitchen, the production meeting. John was in it he was on it. It's a really fun conversation if you can make it. Uh, it's it, the, the, the show is getting there, but it's a great context for a show talking about production. So anyway, hopefully we'll see you guys there. All right. Um, we're gonna jump into the post show and see a bunch of you tonight. We have, we're all getting together tonight again. Can't get enough of it. All right. Thanks, Greg. And thanks to, thanks to all the panelists. Thanks to the producers. Wow. A lot of questions. You put us, you tested us. The panelists came up and, uh, and were able to make it work. We were a little over, but not, but, but not too much. Uh, and so, uh, really, really great work to everyone. All right. Take care.